Good Monday morning, everyone. It is 9 a.m. live from the NASDAQ market site in New York City. I'm Brad Smith alongside Shauna Smith, and this is Yahoo Finance Live. Here is your morning rundown. In a show of support, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken is back in Israel as the nation prepares a major military offensive in Gaza. Blinken's visit, the second in just a few days, it comes as President Biden warned of a new Israeli occupation of Gaza being a big mistake. And there's no word yet on whether Biden will accept Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's invitation to visit the nation. Plus, chipping away, the U.S. is reportedly upping its restrictions around the sale of semiconductors to China by American companies. Now, the additional crackdown will be the latest effort by officials to limit China's access to powerful AI chips. Meanwhile, China's central bank is pumping billions in liquidity into the banking system to support the nation's lackluster economic growth. Let's see whether or not it's going to help. And no more refills. Drugstore chain Rite Aid filed for bankruptcy over the weekend. The company had been struggling with billions in debt in the face of declining sales. The nail in the coffin, question mark? Well, the government's claim that Rite Aid filled hundreds of unlawful opioid prescriptions. Competitors CBS and Walgreens have both already settled with more than a dozen states, paying more than $15 billion for their involvement in the opioid crisis. Let's start with one of our top stories of the day, the morning driver. And it's a big week for earnings, but geopolitical risks remaining front and center for investors as conflict in the Middle East continues to escalate. President Biden now weighing a possible visit to Israel later this week as he warns against a long term Israeli occupation of the Gaza Strip. Obviously, real implications here for investors when we talk about what the ripple effects of this could potentially be if we do, in fact, see an escalation. We saw the rhetoric pick up over the weekend, whether or not Iran is going to get involved. We have threats there. But what this means for investors, first, you got to look to the energy market. And we certainly yeah. did see movement in the price of crude when you go back to last week. And here we are starting the week just below 90 bucks a barrel. Many investors, many analysts keeping a close eye on the price of crude because we really know that that could potentially uh, dictate the sentiment for investors this week. And whether or not we do see an escalation over there, that's Bike above 100 bucks a barrel, exactly what that means, not only for analysts, not only for investors, but obviously for the broader economy as well. And we heard this come up in some of the Fed speak last week. Now, of course, over the weekend, that's where we're continuing to monitor where some of these market movements, especially coming into the start of this week, have netted us out. But ultimately, thinking back to how even Federal Reserve, FOMC members, are thinking about the tensions geopolitically and internationally here, this was talked about by uh, Governor. Michelle Bowman, who said and talked about highlighting how p geopolitical tensions can pose financial stability risks, for example, through greater financial market volatility or more indirectly through their possible effects on economic activity and inflation. And it's that inflationary uh, part that you were alluding to as well with regard to oil, how that can pass through and be an inflationary pressure. But then additionally here, as we think just about what it costs to produce goods and ultimately make sure that they are getting to the necessary market that they're going to be sold in in a timely manner, that too, and added shipping costs or considerations for where you need to reroute mm -hmm. around certain territories, that is something that also has an inflationary knock-on effect as well. And something we heard from Diamond in terms of what he was saying for the warning here about the coming quarters or coming years, calling it potentially the most dangerous time that we have seen right now in decades. And what that means for the broader market, whether or not this is going to be a theme, I suspect it will be on what we're hearing from some chief executives from executives in general on the earnings call uh, this season, just in terms of what it means uh, specifically for their business and also just for the broader industry. So certainly a headwind that investors are closely watching as well as business leaders all over the world. Spot on. You mentioned Jamie Dimon. So let's talk a little bit about the yeah. banks here. JP Morgan, Citigroup and Wells Fargo kicked off earnings season with a bang last week. We saw higher interest rates help lift the fortunes of the nation's largest banks. Investors, they have another busy week ahead. Goldman Sachs and Bank of America are set to report their Q3 results on Tuesday before the bell rings. Could big banks set the standard for how earnings season will play out this quarter? Let's bring in Gerard Cassidy, RBC Capital Markets Analyst. And Gerard, one of the kind of magical words that we've been looking for, at least as has come up through some of our previous discussions, as we were looking for what would be the tenor of this earnings season was cost discipline. Is there a kind of a magic word or a general theme that you expect to prevail over the course of this earnings season? 
Yes, there is, in our opinion, and that's all going to do with credit quality. And, and as you know, the single most important issue for any bank is the trends in credit quality. Now, there's also been, of course, uh, topics uh, such as the unrealized bond losses in their bond portfolios and margin pressure that's developed because deposit rates have moved higher. But in the long run, or when we look out over the next 12 to 18 months, I think it's all, all going to be focused on credit quality, which today is actually quite strong. But George, is that something that you think can stay intact? And also going back to what you just mentioned there about deposit rates, we talk about the fact that many of the larger banks obviously in a better position to weather some of that headwind right now. But what? how does that position some of the smaller, more regional plays? It's a good question because when you take a look at credit quality, obviously we all know about the downtown office space and big urban markets. That's a real troubled market. Most of the smaller regional banks are not exposed to that market. They generally have higher exposures to commercial real estate, but it's not in those downtown large office buildings in our big urban markets. And on the deposit side, the real key question what we have to focus on is when does the Federal Reserve reach its terminal rate for Fed funds? Because over the last four tightening cycles, Around five to six months following the terminal rate for Fed funds, deposit rates stop going up. And that's real positive for the banks because what happens is the cash flows coming off of the asset side of the balance sheet from securities and loans are reinvested at higher yields, helping their net interest margin expand. So the key question again is when will the Fed reach its terminal rate? And in the past, that's been a real catalyst for bank stocks to do better. For banks, especially as you were mentioning, some of the dynamic that, that they're going through right now, where you do have some of the banks that are kind of carrying the most wealthy client base in the, in the assets under management. And you, and you think about what Goldman, uh, Goldman is potentially going to say, especially given the outflows that we've started to see, at least for some of those bank customers that have said, you know what, I want to sit on the sidelines outside of some of my typical investments now and perhaps go into cash or go into other asset types. Where do you expect that to show up in some of the financial performance? I, I think you put your finger on it because, you know, that old expression, cash is king, I think is coming back when you can earn over 5% on your cash sitting in a money market mutual fund. So I think what you're going to hear from Goldman and others that have the wealth management business is that the inflows are still uh, strong, uh, but they're moving more into cash-like products that, high, that have lower margins. The push into equities is, is kind of softened. And so assets are, are moving higher, but they're moving more into cash. And we would expect to hear not only Goldman talk about that, but Morgan Stanley as well when they release their numbers this week. John, I'm curious, your perspective on the tone from the bank so far. Obviously, we just heard from three of the large banks on Friday. We're going to hear from more uh, this week when we look ahead to Goldman and Morgan Stanley. But what's your assessment and just how that compares to the tone that we heard from management over the last couple of quarters? Uh, what we've seen in terms of the tone, the further we move away from March, the less um, distressed the tone is. Obviously, with the bank failures in March and then in the reporting of first quarter results in April and then second in, in July, there was a concern. Um, you know, there was a lot of uncertainty. But as we move away and the contagion risk has um, shown, it has not shown up, it, I think banks are more confident that as we move forward, more normalcy is going to be coming into their business. But as Jamie Dimon pointed out and you highlighted, we're in a very um, tough geopolitical environment with this recent outbreak of the conflict in the Middle East that adds greater risk to the banks, no doubt about it. Now, as you know, our U.S. regionals are not global banks like a J.P. Morgan, but it is very unsettling what's going on, and it's very disruptive, and it, it could pose you know, some un, um, unfortunate risk for even the regional banks as we go forward. But for the domestic U.S. banking industry, moving further away from March has led to a much better tone on the third quarter call.
Gerard, we were we were kind of waiting for what would or what was expected to be the next shoe to drop after the banking crisis earlier this year for some of the regionals that led to some of that consolidation that we did see mid-year and commercial real estate that continued to come up in conversation. How much of a risk is that still for the banks right now? It, it is probably the most pressing question for the banks. Fortunately, because of the debacle in 1990 the long memories for some of these senior bank executives, the U.S. banking industry, um, specifically the top 20 banks, they just don't have the exposure to commercial real estate like they had in the 1990 debacle. As a result, it's going to be manageable. That doesn't mean we're not going to see you know, default, which we are. We've seen Wells Fargo and PNC on Friday lift the reserve for their office commercial real estate portfolio, those are the loan loss reserves, to over 7%, which is very high. And they're preparing to obviously have defaults materialize as we move through this cycle. But in terms of the biggest exposures, it's in the shadow banking industry. It's not in the commercial banks amongst the large mm -hmm. banks. In the shadow banking industry, it's the CMBF, the commercial mortgage-backed security portfolios. That's where the risk is. And when you look at some of the high-profile defaults in when Brookfield defaulted in Los Angeles, handed back the keys on that big property, Blackstone in New York on the 7th Avenue property. What you're seeing is the banks were not the lenders. It was CMBS. So the CMBS market is the one that's suffering the pain right now rather than the large banks. So, Gerard, given all this, what's your top pick right now for the sector? We would say that going, if you want a large um Market cap name, Bank America would be it. Uh, they have obviously been uh, underperforming this year. Everybody uh, is concerned about their large unrealized bond losses that they have in the health and maturity portfolio. But I think as uh, rates stabilize, that will become less of a concern. They've got an incredible consumer deposit base. They're one of our premier large lenders here in the United States. On a regional side, I, we would go with two names, PNC, who we just talked about, reported on Friday. We expect them to continue to grow their franchise nationwide, particularly as they um, sell more of their commercial banking products into their BBVA acquisition that they completed two to three years ago. That gives them added growth potential. They also picked off a, a $9 billion or so of loans from the FDIC from the signature bank failure which, uh, again, is uh, quite positive. And then for Midwest Regional, Fifth Third, um, about 20 to 22 percent of the franchise is in the southeast. The remainder is in the Midwest. And over the long run, you know, the, um, the onshoring of America is real, and this company will benefit from that over the long run. But in the meantime, they're growing their consumer business very well. They have a relatively new CEO who's very dynamic and looking to grow this company, you know, well into the next five to, to 10 years. All right, Gerard Cassidy, always great to get your insight. RBC Capital Markets Analyst. Thanks, Gerard. Thank you. Well, it's not yet retail results season, but one word will no doubt come up when they report third quarter of results next month, and that is shrink. Inventory shrink can happen due to a host of reasons, but one has become most prevalent, crime. Walmart, Target, and Macy's are among the retailers calling out criminal organizations for hurting inventory levels over recent months. In August, Target CEO Brian Cornell said that he was facing, quote, an unacceptable amount of retail theft and organized retail crime. That same month, Walmart highlighted the complexity of the issue. CFO John David Rainey saying that it was still increasing but was presenting unevenly across the country. The cost is certainly mounting. The National Retail Federation's Retail Security Survey shows retailers lost $112 billion due to the problem in 2022. This is not a new issue. Over the last few years, the likes of Lowe's and Home Depot have increasingly out been outspoken over it. New legislation looks to tackle the issue, but increasingly it seems that big business is taking matters into its own hands. Let's speak with one of those retailers now. We're joined by Scott Glenn, Home Depot's Vice President of Asset Protection. Also with us for the conversation, we've got Yahoo Finance's Diane King-Hall. Uh, Scott, great to have you here to, to really 
kind of dive into this conversation. And for our viewers out there that listen into the Home Depot earnings call quarter after quarter, they hear from people like your chief financial officer, Richard, saying that this has been a constant pressure over the last several quarters and even the last few years. And it's something that we are tackling every day. This is something that you are tackling every day. What would you say the state of tackling shrink right now is for a company like Home Depot and across the retail industry? Yeah, good morning, guys, and uh, thanks for having us on uh, today. So I uh, appreciate your attention to this problem. A um, couple things that I would, I would mention immediately. Um, as you mentioned, shrink is a multifaceted component uh, part. So there are certainly uh, a theft, there's certainly a theft component to that piece of it. There's certainly an operational component to it. There's an unknown component to it. But certainly the, um, the organized retail crime piece, as you mentioned, has been growing in scale and breadth over the last several years. Uh, there's a lot of different reasons for that, but um, it's been putting more and more pressure on us, uh, certainly over the last five to seven years. Scott, uh, Diane here. Uh, you all had a big breakthrough recently uh, with regard to uh, the issue of shrink at your company, uh, an individual and more than one individual that you are pursuing. Talk to us about the developments there with regard to that breakthrough. And I learned a new term in this process of fence. What is that? Yeah, so, so um, I, I know you're referring to a recent case down in Florida. Um, what, what I would say is less of a breakthrough and more of a um, illustration of what happens day in and day out. Um, these cases are pretty typical of what we see both in uh, the scale and the, and the breadth of those cases. So um, recently, um, this case in particular, I don't want to get too much detail because it's actually still a pending criminal matter. But what you refer to as a fence, as, as a term, every organized retail crime basically has two components. And it has a booster group, a group of individuals that actually go into most of the stores and commit the crimes and procure the merchandise, for lack of a better term. And then who they turn it over to, which is the fence, the person that is kind of pulling the strings behind the scenes that is orchestrating the events. Um, think about it as your traditional organized retail crime family where you have people out there doing the work and then kicking up um, some of the some of the, com the component pieces of it, ultimately the profits and then monetizing the products, reselling it, using it for other types of crimes, um, human trafficking, drugs, guns, you name it. There's all kinds of other kind of tentacles that happen relative to these types of organized crime cases. Scott, do you think we've seen the worst of it? Um, unfortunately, I don't. Um, I think that the, the problem has been been um, magnified a little bit over the last couple of years. The, we're getting the appropriate amount of attention on it. Uh, it's gotten the attention of, you know, not only the retail uh, folks, but also law enforcement, politicians and judges. But I think we're really kind of at the upslope uh, beginning of this. And until we get, you know, critical mass across the country at the state, local and federal level, we're not going to get this problem, uh, you know, kicked out anytime soon. So what needs to happen then, Scott, to really address the issue, especially you said we're not at the peak of this problem? Yeah, I, again, I think uh, we're, we're, we're at, the, at the beginning of this, right? I think people are starting to understand that this is not petty shoplifting. This is not something that, you know, somebody's coming in and stealing a hammer from the Home Depot. These are folks that are stealing in mass and that the crimes that these folks are monetizing and funding with the dollars that come from this touch many, many other areas um, that, that a lot of folks are very interested in. As, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, drugs, guns, human trafficking, other money laundering is certainly one that's out there. And I think as that starts to permeate through the US, as it starts to permeate through the justice system, people are starting to really understand how important and how critical it is for us to treat this problem seriously. As that continues to grab hold, we're gonna see better, you know, better uh, controls around this process. We're gonna see people that are uh, held accountable at a much higher level uh, across the board. To, to what extent has this also had an impact on the relationship between retailers like yourself and Home Depot uh, and some of the companies who you purchase wholesale from in order to move that inventory through your own retail footprint and stores online and brick and mortar? 
Yeah, I, I mean, so there's there's two sides of it, right? There's the supply chain side of it, um, as you kind of refer to, and and it, it's it certainly puts pressure on all of us in terms of keeping our shelves full, um, keeping product available for the customer, and continuing to fulfill that piece of it. And then there's the back side of it, as you mentioned, the online side of it, where not that we don't we don't have a relationship with those folks, we do work with those folks, but we certainly think that the online resellers can and should be doing more to kind of police themselves to make sure that they're not a um, you know a place where people can easily go out there and sell stolen property, frankly at you know prices that are lower than the brick and mortar folks uh, can in some cases buy it for. And Scott, in terms of the solutions, uh, what legislation do you want to see happen to help solve this problem, number one? And then number two, is there a cost that consumers will end up bearing as a result of shrink? Yeah, of course. For for part one, I mean, it's it's we're starting to get there in terms of local state task forces. Uh, many state attorney generals at this point have been a little bit out in front of this and kind of seeing the, the writing on the wall and putting uh, task forces together, dedicated uh, law enforcement folks, dedicated prosecutors, changing um, you know, the, 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 the outcomes that happen for uh, aggregation and you know, retail crime in general and taking it more seriously. But certainly we wanna to continue to see more pressure similar to what was done last year and the implementation of the Informed uh, Consumers Act uh, we want to see continuing legislation at the federal level around organized retail crime task forces, dedicated resources, and a dedicated agency um, you know, that can really kind of take the lead on this. Because right now, it's really, um, for us retailers, it's whomever we can happen to go get to take this uh, problem seriously is the one that will, will hopefully take this case and prosecute it. So we really need a much more coordinated and systemic effort at the federal level to take this problem seriously and really understand how much it impacts not only the financials of retailers and consumers, but also the safety and of, of the associates in our stores and the customers and the shopping public at large. Scott, thanks so much for taking the time here today. Really important matter and one that we're going to continue to track, especially as we go further into earnings season. Scott Glenn, Home Depot Vice President of Asset Protection and Yahoo Finance's Diane King Hall joining for the conversation. Thank you both. Thank you, guys. Well, we've just got inside of 10 minutes until the opening bell. Let's see what the stocks are doing this morning here in the pre-market trading. And we're taking a look at at least the U.S. major averages as of right now. You've got the Dow, the S&P 500, and the NASDAQ, all of those in positive territory. Futures pointing higher for the Dow by about six-tenths of a percent. The S&P 500 futures, that's up by about six-tenths of a percent as well. And then additionally, you're taking a look at the NASDAQ futures. That's also higher this morning by about, uh, yeah, Four tenths of a percent right now, 65 points being added on there. All right, well, we've got all your market action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Let's take a look at some market movers this morning. And first up, we got to start with Pfizer because shares on the move after the company slashed its full year guidance on lower demand for COVID products. Now, the U.S. drug maker cutting its sales forecast for its COVID vaccine and also for therapy. Some analysts saying that the reduction was larger than expected. The company expecting 2023 sales of 58 billion to 61 billion. Now that's down from its previous guidance. Yet we are seeing shares move to the upside. When it comes to some of the reaction that we're seeing from the street here this morning, largely most of this was expected. So not necessarily catching the street by surprise. Jeffrey's out with the note saying that they think investors have some attractive catalysts here, a path going forward. They raised actually Pfizer to outperform post that CGen deal close here. So certainly some catalysts on the horizon for this company. And also Wells Fargo's reaction just saying that Pfizer resetting its COVID forecast is a good first step towards recovery. And now they need to execute on some of those new launches that they have on tap. So lots of the focus being placed going forward about what's in the pipeline and what could also help Pfizer regain some of that momentum that's clearly lost uh, since the start of the year. Yeah, this company is set to report earnings in just a few weeks here. And one of the huge things that we're going to be watching out for when they do report earnings, I believe, on the 31st of October here is, and I bring this up time and time again now, I guess, and as we're looking for and searching for a theme for this earnings season, but cost discipline is going to be something you hear about them with them because they've already said it before. They've got whole cost realignment program. So all this taking place as they've got this program that's expected to deliver these savings of at least three and a half billion dollars, one billion of that expected to be realized in 2023. Two and a half billion of that expected to be realized in 2024. And they're also looking at a lot of one time costs to achieve those savings of that cost realignment program, expected to be about $3 billion, mostly cash there. So a lot of this kind of baked into and really how investors are going to have to continue to track where in that cost savings or cost realignment, where there's restructuring that gets put forward, where there's perhaps looking across the portfolio of different services, solutions rather, uh, that they've brought to market and where they have to sunset others. This is a big IP time for a lot of the healthcare industry, especially in the biopharma side, and where they decide to either reallocate costs away from one part of the business in order to make a strategic investment that's going to help them for 15, 20 years to be able to hold on to patents. That's something to be able to keep an eye on as well going into these reports as we expect to hear more on that front. Yeah, I think you're exactly right there, Brad. And we talk about some of the pressure that we've seen on these stocks and more broadly across the sector. Obviously, we know competition has been heating up. Up. Lots of emphasis, lots of pressure placed on some of these companies, specifically Pfizer and Moderna, in terms of what's going to happen now. Now that we're past peak use when it comes to COVID or peak demand, I should say, for the COVID shots, for some of the therapy, for the treatment, obviously weighing on Pfizer's results here in the most recent quarters. A headwind here, we take a look at the current quarter. So transitioning from that focus going forward, what exactly that's going to be, a lot of that reliant on what is in the pipeline here in terms of new drugs, new therapies, and how that is going to boost results here down the line. And that's largely what we are hearing from analysts here this morning. JP Morgan saying that there are a number of questions and uncertainties from here. They also further lowered their COVID forecast as a result of what we heard from Pfizer this morning in terms of their updated guidance. So the street, we know, is going to remain focused on these earnings that we're going to be getting uh, very soon. And then, of course, what that tells us about the industry here moving forward. Let's take a look at the opening bell on Wall Street, doing a quick check of the markets here as we kick off another week here with the same sorts of risks obviously posed here to investors. When we talk about escalating tensions in the Middle East, exactly what that means, the pressure that could place on the markets as a result of rising energy prices. And then also more earnings results on top. We'll hear from a number of companies this week. Some of the big headlines coming from some of the larger banks starting tomorrow when we hear from Bank of America. Then we got Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, just to name a few. But we're starting the week at least with gains right now, Brad. We are indeed. We're taking a look at the major U.S. averages here, the Dow, the S&P 500, and the NASDAQ, all in positive territory. I'm going to take a look at the Wi-Fi Interactive here this morning, though, where we've got a little bit more of a look at each of those averages here intraday at least, or at least over the past couple days here. I want to give you a view of the five-day view for the Dow Jones Industrial Average, just so you could see some of that activity as we've seen transpire over the past five days, still net higher by about eight-tenths of a percent for the Dow. NASDAQ Composite, past five days, it's down by about two-tenths of a percent. We'll round that off, too. And the S&P 500, past five days, looking up by about three-tenths of a percent here. Also want to take a look at the sector activity that we've seen 
coming out of the gate to start off this morning. Whoop, let me just toggle on over to that just so our folks at home can get a solid look at those 11 S&P 500 sectors that you've no doubt got pinned to your whiteboard, just like the periodic table. No doubt we keep ours moving, though, here. Intraday, you're seeing XLB leading the pack right now. That's up. Materials, seeing gains of about 1% here, also followed closely by industrials. And then additionally, you've got communication services right behind it. But then additionally, uh, pulling up the caboose, but still in positive territory as all 11 S&P 500 sectors are in positive territory to start the day. XLU, that's up by about one tenth of a percent. So the lowest of the gainers, however, still looking pretty good here. Let's also take a look at Bitcoin as well here, though, because we've got a lot of activity that's transpiring here. Just want to toggle on over to our crypto stocks here. Uh, it's not in our currencies. Is it in our currencies? It's not yet. So let me go on back over to, um, yeah, we're just going to go back on over here. It'll make it a lot easier to get to. Anyway, taking a look at cryptocurrency here. Let's just slide on down and get a look at Bitcoin as it slowly gets there. You're taking a look at the notes as we're on the way in route in the neighborhood. We're getting so close. We're getting We've close, closer, index. closer. My goodness. Well, it's 10% higher right now for Bitcoin. 10% <laughs> higher on the day is what we're hearing. We'll get to that chart eventually here. I'll surely be able to scroll to it by the end of this block. <laughs> yeah, we know. Lots of options in there. I'm Bitcoin. We got it? All right. We just in oh, just time. As they take and it away. just wiped off. You guys got to throw it up there. He worked hard to find Bitcoin on the interactive. But all right, take our word for it. It's up just about 10% right now, as you can see, just below that 30,000 level. All right, let's talk a little bit more about some of the movers today. And Rite Aid shares on the move as a drugstore chain files for Chapter 11 bankruptcy protection. You can see shares off another 17%. The company saying that lenders agreed to extend over $3.4 billion in new funding to help with liquidity as it restructures. Rite Aid also saying that it plans on closing underperforming locations the company has been struggling for years now. Now it's been dealing with slowing sales, growing debt, and also lawsuits alleging the company oversupplied painkillers, which fueled the country's opioid pandemic epidemic. When it comes to those lawsuits, facing over 8,000 lawsuits, just to put that uh, in perspective for everyone out there. So this is a company obviously been struggling now for quite some time. We've been talking about their mounting debt now for a while. They're also facing an increase in competition from some of the rivals, some of the other players in this space, looking to offset some of their losses in the retail business with more exposure to the pharmacy side of things. So it has raised $3.45 billion to fund its operations while in bankruptcy. It does expect, like we said, to continue to operate most of its, its stores and continue to serve its customers. But many obviously expected this would ultimately happen. Yeah, we've already seen settlements, as uh, we had mentioned earlier in the show, and again for this conversation, between Walgreens and CVS. And so now only right that Right Aid would also have to go through these similar type uh, proceeding here and and ultimately as we think about Rite Aid and kind of kind of chronologize um, uh, well you know the word in the chronological order that's played out here for Rite Aid I mean it's a company that's had to sell off 1900 of its locations in what was an attempted full buyout of the company by uh, Walgreens many years ago they only were able to get about 1900 locations after that you had Rite Aid continuing to operate uh, many of these pharmacies trying to figure out okay how would they make sure that they got foot traffic back in the door how would they make sure that even at the peak of some of the COVID administration, vaccine administration, and even tests that they were still seeing people opt to buy there versus buying at some of the other larger chains there in Rite Aid for what we had seen for many years, for decades. This was one of the larger players in the PBM side and the pharmacy benefits management side. But however, as that started to wane, even for some of the largest players and move over to some of the convenience factors that are out there, whether that be a pill pack, whether that be a cost plus, I think that's certainly taken a chunk out of that business for a company in Rite Aid as well, as well as not having the same type of footprint that they did before they had sold off so many locations to Walgreens. So uh, we'll continue to watch this proceeding for bankruptcy for Rite Aid and bring you the latest there. But in some other kicking fun news, kicking it over to our next mover, Manchester United shares, they are on the move this morning. Qatari billionaire Sheikh Jassim bin Hamad Al Thani withdrawing his bid to buy out the soccer club. Following the withdrawal, British billionaire Jim Ratcliffe looking to acquire at least a 25% stake in the soccer club. That's according to a report by Reuters. The proposed terms of Ratcliffe's offer, they're unknown. But reports say it would put Manchester United's value at about $6.5 billion. It seems like the ownership 
wars continue to move forward with this one. Yeah, I think we're all trying to figure out how exactly this is going to play out. But you mentioned that potential stake here from Ratcliffe, 25 percent Manchester United, valuing the club $6.1 billion. That valuation would put potential share price close to double where it is today, just below 20 bucks a share here. So it puts in perspective just exactly how much this is worth. Now, we've been talking about this for quite some time, just what Manchester United is going to be able to get in terms of their valuation. That's $6.1 billion, well below what some of the uh, top line of forecast were for. But we're seeing the reaction in shares because of this off just about 10% today in early trading, off just about 18% over the last six months. And you mentioned that Qatari bid there. It was the only offer for 100% of Manchester United. And we know that that offer came with lots of promises in terms of redeveloping, redeveloping the club, redeveloping the stadium. So now that they're pivoting away from that and that offer no longer on the table, lots of questions about what it's going to look like here. Can I just say that I'm all for publicly traded sports clubs. I, I would love to see more of them, especially if they have value internationally. Manchester certainly carries that. I don't know that my Philadelphia Eagles would have the same type of fanfare Oh, it certainly would. Not I that mean, we're biased or anything. I mean, not at all. We've only got all of the Philadelphia Eagles fans that are at Yahoo Finance in studio at NASDAQ <laughs> with us today. But... Even as you think about some of the legacy organizations, the sports clubs that would be internationally so valuable yeah. and, and see, because Manchester has a $3 billion market cap publicly traded here. Mm -hmm. There are some organizations that offer shares and say you had more of these entities go public and have non-voting shares that people were able to buy. I, I don't know. I think they'd still be able to find some fanfare around that. Certainly makes it a little bit more exciting, too. It does, you right? know, yeah. a little more transparency. Yeah, like it's a good idea. Maybe yeah. we'll see it happen for more of these clubs going forward. All right, guys, let's also talk about another one of our favorite stocks, and that is Lululemon shares moving to the upside this morning. I'm nearly eight percent over four hundred bucks a share. The athletic apparel company replacing Activision on the S&P 500 starting Wednesday. This coming after UK regulators approved Microsoft's takeover deal of Activision. That deal closing last week. Now it's another win for Lululemon. Earlier this summer, the company lifted its full year forecast, seeing revenue now between $9.51 billion and $9.57 billion. That's, that's thanks to better than expected second quarter earnings. We talk about the fact that demand for Lululemon right now not can, doesn't seem to be at least too pressured by some of the more macroeconomic pressures that we are seeing other retailers grapple with. But at this point, you're looking at Lululemon, their second quarter, they had revenue up 18%. Their comp sales were up 11%. Their DTC business, which has been a growing focal point here for the company, up just about 15%. And then that recent deal with Peloton. Yeah. So certainly things, it seems to be looking up here for Lululemon. I didn't even realize I was wearing my Lululemon jacket for this conversation today. <laughs> but, but besides that, you know, taking a look at Lululemon over the, not just the past two days, but over the course of this year, and you think about the decision making that, that has come about strategically in, the, in this broader kind of power of three times two that they lean into. And year to date, they're, they're performing well. Right now, it's up by about 27%. But you think about what it's going to take over these next few years and the targets that they've set forth in order to double digital, in order to make sure that even in their categories, they're seeing expansion, whether that's footwear. And I can't wait to finally get perhaps next summer, some of the flip-flops in the men's category. I tried them out this summer. They're pretty cushiony. Well, well done. But at the end of the day, the store footprints, uh, store footprints as well, um, and we talked about how much of that store footprint was also leaning into trying to move through much of those mirror devices and try to use that as a selling opportunity. It didn't work. So ultimately, I think the deal that you mentioned with Peloton, that gives them an out, gives them the ability to for a bad decision that was made in purchasing Mirror to be able to say, okay, now we've got this new partnership that allows us to sunset Mirror, really focus on the partnership with Peloton, and perhaps that'll make sure that there's more of the integration between the mindset or mindshare of people that are legacy Peloton uh, riders like yourself. I know you mm -hmm. Peloton out there too. I, I wish I could. I only do it in hotels. But perhaps some of those Peloton riders out there that are saying, you know what, Lulu, perhaps I'll give that a shot for my next rider. Clipping. Yeah, and it also ends a long-standing feud between the two companies, right, that were going back and forth. But I learned something new. I didn't know that they sold men's footwear. Or I knew that they sold men's footwear, not sandals. Only though. the flip-flops. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, we don't have the sneakers yet. Interesting. All right. And they're comfy? They are, yes. Very but comfy. they're expensive, probably, oh, too. All right, guys, we got to leave that conversation there. But all your market action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
The dysfunction surrounding the election of a House Speaker isn't letting up anytime soon. And now with lawmakers back in Washington, the pressure is mounting for GOP members. Now, conservative Jim Jordan is pursuing his quest this week with the House expected to vote tomorrow. If Jordan is elected, what will that mean for investors for the broader market? Here with us now, I want to bring in Ben Emmons, a senior portfolio manager and head of fixed income and macro at New Edge Wealth. Ben, it's great to have you here on set. Lots to uh, get into with you here today, but let's first start with the House Speaker race, exactly what this could mean for investors. If Jim Jordan has an uphill battle here, if he is elected House Speaker, how should we expect the markets to respond? So I have a take on this, actually. You know, obviously, he's somewhat controversial, and he has a lot of, like, really, I'd say, stark opinions. Mm -hmm. But one thing that he is really in favor of is to cut fiscal spending very dramatically. Now, one of the things that's been happening over the last, say, three months, Treasury yields continue to rise because we are issuing a lot more bonds because obviously we're spending a lot of money. Now, it's not so simple to change sp fiscal spending, but he's one of that is probably going to be, you know, in the House, a really strong voice and try to drive the spending to a lower level. And there's more people on board with that view. So I think if he does become Speaker, ironically, the bond market would potentially embrace it as a positive because, you know, it means in the future less supply. And, and that, I think, is meaningful for markets, given what we've been through over the last few months. I mean, it, it still sounds like, so for the party, even if they were to come together around Jordan, then they would still have to figure out, okay, what is our strategy and policy going forward even further from here? What do you need to see from the party's policy to emerge around some economic kind of uh, to stability to prevail once we get into 2024 and even beyond then? Yeah, and that is an open question, Brett, because, you know, on the one hand, you can say, let's cut spending down to the bone, but that's not that simple because it affects the economy really if, immediately almost, and it's an election year, so it's not that straightforward. On the other hand, it's about, like, what, what is the right level of fiscal spending and balanced budget, and there's just not good ideas about it, both Democratic and, and GOP. So I think this is going to be a, an uncertain situation. So as much as it, it may be, like, he could be embraced as positive, as in markets try to discount something from it. I think it's the uncertainty about what's going to happen to fiscal spending in next year and how it's going to change that could lead to more volatility in interest rates. And that's what we're seeing playing out as we speak. But what's your assessment just of the bond market right now, more specifically what we're seeing in Treasuries? Because we have also renewed risk going off of the uh, growing escalation of the Middle East conflict, what the potential ripple effects of that is going to be. When you take a look at where yields are now, those levels, how much higher do you see them potentially trending? So it's amazing that normally in a flight to safety environment, which we're sort of in currently, and, you know, the news today is that they're ready to invade Gaza at some point, right? If these refugees comes out and humanitarian aid is given, you probably can expect to be ground assault. And Swiss franc gold and those type of safe havens are up, but treasuries are not. And I think there's two things going on. One, it is this supply, it is this fiscal picture that's continued to pressure yields. But on the other hand, it's that we don't really know how Iran is going to be involved one way or the other. And that's where the oil markets are focused on. Lots of views that the oil could go to 100 or even $150 a barrel in the event that there will be some sort of a involvement of Iran and, and tension and that the supply from Iran, oil production will be cut down significantly. Yeah, and that drives up Treasury yields because... Amazingly, as much as we went up in yields over the last, say, three months, there's been very little inflation risk priced into Treasury yields. The, the inflation break even, as we say, between real yields and nominal yields has been very flat, very, like, stable. Mm -hmm. And that has to do, I think, that people expect the Fed to raise rates enough that inflation will stay contained. So as it is underpriced inflation risk and this risk of an oil spike may happen, well, yeah, then Treasury yields could fluctuated a lot and not be the safe haven even if you have a flight to safety environment. How does that conflict though also impact some of the monetary policy or even fiscal policy around the world? Other markets that have either tried to get inflation under control in their in their own measures or just tried in China's case to stimulate the economy? Yeah, so if you take a step back and what happened with Ukraine last year, went into that situation and we didn't have a good sense of like what it actually meant. There was some complacent views even about, yeah, this one maybe just locally there. And it turned out to be that it was a major oil food shock, so to speak, meaning like, you know, food was really becoming elevated 
you know, part of, of inflation. With Israel, it's about chips. It plays a really important po uh, a key uh, play in the chip uh, supply chain. So you get this disruption there that's going to affect that supply chain. We know what that could do. Right? It could impact uh, auto production. It could impact different areas. So this, this is other inflationary impact there that we don't really know how that's going to play out. So to monetary policy and fiscal policy globally, you would once again see monetary policy at some point react and say this higher for longer is even higher and then longer. Right? Whereas in the case of fiscal policy it would be that ongoing you know, challenge about rounding, you know, basically surrounding Israel and saying, I will give you all the support as we know, in the home base here, there's a lot of challenge with that, right? So I think it's just a lot of uncertainty, right, that we're looking at. And has this at all changed your base case in terms of whether or not we're going to see a recession? We talk about a potential here for a pullback. How big of a pullback should investors be bracing for? I think under the scenario of, of this $100, $150 a barrel mm -hmm. for oil, that would be a, really an effect on the economy here. We, we would, would get way too high gas prices again against already a, a slowing economy, that would bring the recession again forward. Now, Wall Street Journal had a nice article this weekend that the, the probability of recession has really fallen a lot because, well, yeah, we're spending a lot of fiscal money and that's affecting the economy positively. So that would be the other scenario. If we're getting political tension around fiscal spending, the combination of high oil prices and that could slow the economy more down. I'm of the view still, though, that the economy is still not really close to any kind of recession, uh, really because we have robust spending and, and mm -hmm. consumer confidence being more affected by inflation overall and political environment than actually the economy. Plus we have investment in the economy. Otherwise, treasury yields would be starting declining quite significantly. So, but that these risks are there are clear. High oil prices and change in fiscal policy, that's something I think we have to start counting, you know, factoring in our investment policy and investment strategy next year. Ben Ammons, great to have you here in studio with us. Uh, New Edge Wealth Insider Portfolio, Wealth Senior Portfolio <laughs> Manager and Head of Fixed Income. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. We've got all your markets action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Welcome back, everyone. We're live from the NASDAQ market site. U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken back in Israel as the nation prepares for a major military offensive in Gaza. 
President Biden called for restraint in an interview with 60 Minutes over the weekend, saying it would be a big mistake for Israel to occupy the densely populated region. Ahead of the anticipated escalation in the conflict, officials in China weighed in. In a phone call with a Saudi official, China's foreign minister called Israel's actions in Gaza beyond self-defense. China's official news agency reporting this and with more on what motivated China's comments and what they could mean for the conflict moving forward, we've got Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman. Hey, Rick. Hey, guys. Well, no surprise here. China is not exactly uh, lining up on the side of Israel and the United States. Uh, they have not condemned Hamas for the uh, terrorist attacks inside Israel. Uh, and now they're saying that Israel is going too far. And Israel is not even in the Gaza Strip yet uh, in terms of military forces on the ground. But uh, China is saying they're going a little bit too far. So what is going on here? Uh, I mean, the, in the broader picture, uh, China has been cozying up to Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia and other Arab nations in the Middle East, um, mainly because it wants to increase its influence in the Middle East. Uh, uh, China thinks it detects waning U.S. influence in the Middle East. And China is also the world's largest importer of oil. Um, it, is, it has been buying Iranian oil uh, despite sanctions. It doesn't abide by any sanctions on Iranian oil. Uh, it is now uh, Saudi Arabia's top customer. Uh, so this is all about China um, adding to its influence in the Middle East and trying to uh, act as a counterweight to uh, U.S. actions and interests in this region. All right, Rick, we got to leave it there. Thanks so much, as always, for breaking down the latest for us on that. Keep right here on Yahoo Finance. we got all your market action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. We'll be right back. Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news. Three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with a ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. All right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Mester Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas, and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there's more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light and space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance.
What if you could own a piece of the Shrek soundtrack for as low as $10? In this economy, that's about as much as a pumpkin spice latte. What we're saying is there's a new way to invest in your favorite songs. And historically, only wealthier institutional investors could allocate part of their portfolios specifically to music. Now, for the first time, retail investors can approach music like an asset class. The same way you can buy and sell stock, you can now buy a share or slice of a music and take in royalties or dividends. Music royalties could be the next asset in your portfolio. Musicians dove into selling their catalog during the pandemic when live events were largely shut down. If we can bring liquidity to royalties broadly, then like we can make songwriters, artists, producers richer and expand the possibilities of what they could do with their career and their art. That's Gary Young, the CEO of Royalty Exchange, a marketplace that connects those who want to sell their IP with buyers. The buyers on our site are the types of people that could, um, you know, spend $100,000 on a song and it be uh, not um, a huge part of their portfolio, if that makes sense. But now, for the first time ever, according to Public, you can invest in, say, the Shrek soundtrack for as low as $10 a share. But how can you do it? And what even is a royalty? Royalties are income generators, something paid in return for intellectual property or simply the use of that intellectual property. At the end of the day, it just ends up being a payment right is the simplest way to look at it. It's, it's a means that someone has a legal right to receive payment for content being consumed. So for an artist, their songs are their IP, and royalties are payments made to that artist whenever their song is played on the radio or a streaming service like Spotify. Traditionally, music investing was limited to institutional investors. Think hedge funds, who had the capital to purchase the entire song outright, and then they would benefit from all of the royalties associated with that song. But startups like Public and Jukebox want to open the space up to retail investors through fractionalized royalties, meaning you can buy a tiny any slice of the overall royalty pie. We want people to have access to like a you know, multiple set of, of asset classes. And so one of the big pieces of it is, is, is to truly kind of simplify that experience down that, you know, buying a share in an alternative asset like Shrek will be as simple as buying a share in, you know, a certain stock that you, you know, might want to invest into. So it starts at, at IPO literally with 10 bucks. Um, and so that obviously just makes it way more accessible. That was Life Abraham, the co-CEO of Public, an investment platform that's been around since 2019, but just got into the biz of offering up music as an investment. And it's among the first to offer that specifically to retail investors. The firm just IPO'd the score of the Shrek movie franchise. Public purchased the 768 track catalog outright put it into an LLC, and then have that LLC go public so that investors could buy shares at an affordable price. The average song purchased on Royalty Exchange goes for $75,000. So I think it really starts with this approach of being retail first, and you're seeing a big change in the industry. Obviously, you know, Katy Perry is selling her catalog for $225 million. There are very few people who can buy that. You're bound to ask at some point, why isn't retail involved? And it's really just the beginning of this. Like, we're, we're starting this wave of bringing royalties and investing to the investing public. But accessibility doesn't necessarily equate to a good investment. Music royalties can be tricky. Song popularity can obviously fluctuate, and there's not a lot of liquidity in the space since it's so new. And you have to educate yourself. Make sure you've thought through any tax implications or regulatory risks. So we actually file a document with the SEC. It's we walk through basically everything involved that would educate an investor on a particular investment. There's a thorough vetting process that, that goes through for all of this. So Gary Gensler was aware of the Shrek IPO is what I'm hearing. <laughs> I hope he was. <laughs> all of these factors may make investors more inclined to go with the 5% yield on 10-year treasuries as opposed to an unproven Shrek investment. Music streams are not correlated to stocks or bonds or the overall economic picture. Now, because of that, royalties can be considered an alternative to the broader market. It's driven by content consumption. That has nothing to do with what the Fed is doing with interest rates. And that's why investors are increasingly interested in alternative asset classes like royalties. They want to hedge their portfolios with a variety of investments. 
So now that you have the primer on music royalties as an asset class, let's cut to the chase and talk about the potential returns here. We have Alexandra Canal, Madison Mills here with us at the NASDAQ. And guys, you did a great job breaking down exactly what this means, why people or when people would potentially want to invest in music. But Madison, let's first talk about how much people could make, right? Because that a lot of times is the most important factor when they're making some of those uh, investment decisions. Right, that's the question we all want to know, right? How much money are you going to make off of this? If you look at the Shrek investment in particular, which we talked about a lot in this piece, it's looking at about an 8% year over year return when you look at the dividends, or in this case, that would be the royalties. But I wanted to give us one other comparison point here. So if you look at a song like Empire State of Mind, we're here in New York, Jay-Z, Alicia Keys, that track, you're going to get an estimated 9.9% annual return when it comes to the royalties. And what's great about music investing in general, guys, at least that's what some of our sources have said, is that this isn't correlated to the broader stock market, right? If you look at consumer spending, for example, if that goes down, that's not going to impact how often people are listening to, you know, Coldplay, for example, if you're Brad Smith. Oh, just going to out me like that, huh? Right, right? I but, mean, we got to talk but, about but it. But that's a good point because Brad went to the Coldplay I concert. Did, We've did. seen this boom in live events, live concerts across the board. Even the Taylor Swift Eras Tour movie, we got the box office numbers over nearly 100 million in the domestic debut, additional 100 million in the international debut, and that's just opening weekend. So all of these live events are really showing the staying power of music over the long term. And then I also think about TikTok, uh, YouTube, a lot of the digital players, that's giving new life to a lot of these songs. I think about the TikTok of the man drinking cranberry juice, oh, yes. riding oh, his skateboard yes. with Dreams uh, by Fleetwood Mac playing mm -hmm. in the background. That song went viral. And then you have the Gen Z kids calling that the TikTok song, even though that's by Fleetwood Mac, a very prominent band in the 70s. There you go right there. So you're, uh, seeing, you're seeing all of this really <laughs> add to the value of songs and therefore catalogs and consequently royalties. Wow. Okay. So you, you talk about some of the artists that are doing this and like what really makes this make sense for them at the end of the day? Because if they're selling their catalog, but other people looking towards getting into buying some of the royalties later on, what are those factors that they should be considering too? Well, if you think about the catalog sales, yeah. they have just been astronomical, especially over the course of the pandemic when a lot of these artists weren't able to tour. So let's break down some of the value that these catalogs have gone for. Let's start with the boss, Shauna's favorite, Ooh. Bruce Springsteen. So in December of 2021, Springsteen sold both his master recordings, which are the recordings of the actual songs, and his publishing rights, which include the copyrights for things like song writing and composition. Now, this was in a massive deal to Sony Music that was reportedly valued north of $500 million. Sony obviously was Springsteen's home for the past five decades. And now the studio has full ownership of his entire collection, which includes hits like Born to Run, Thunder Road, and Born in the USA. And what's interesting about this deal in particular is we've seen a lot of music investment funds like Hypnosis, for example, really gobble up a lot of these song catalogs. However, in this case, you're seeing the studios want in on the action. Why is that? It's because things like Spotify, Apple Music, streaming has made the business predictable and stable, which is obviously a good thing for investors, in addition to being a good thing for a lot of these backers of these catalogs. And it's not just the older uh, demographic as well. You're seeing Justin Bieber, Katy Perry get in on the action, but also a lot of artists from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. I want to take through some of those. We have the Red Hot Chili Peppers, sold the rights to their song catalog for a reported $150 million deal in May of 2021, Bob Dylan, uh, Stevie Nicks. I mean, it's just a perfect storm for artists at this moment. And a big part of that is streaming. And I wonder how much of it, when, when you talk about why artists are going into this, how much money they can make, what really stands out to me out of that is how drastically different they're all valued, right? So if you're an investor right now trying to figure out what would make the most sense. Yep. It's kind of a tough decision whether or not you go with your personal favorite songs and who you truly believe in as an artist versus maybe what the broader public views as one of their favorites, right? Because that, yeah. I would think, the latter there would potentially earn you a bit more money down the line. Well, it's interesting. One of the interviews that we had, uh, Gary Yun, the CEO of Royalty Exchange, he talked about how there's a lot of staying power in the older classics. So Bruce Springsteen, perfect pick. We talked about Earth, Wind, and Fire. Yes. Those songs have a lot of potential runway to come back through a viral TikTok like we've talked about. So some of some of that kind of historic value is, is stored up for these songs to have a longer shelf life. Yes.
I, I know Earth, Wind, and Fire would be on my catalog that I would purchase. Put it in my portfolio for sure. Right? Yeah. My movie, absolutely. Born in the USA, would be my number one song. That's your number one? Yeah. Yep. Okay. You guys would make a lot of money, I think. I think so. Yeah. yeah. We're on to something here. I know. A new All investment right. idea for yeah. us. We'll have a list together for everybody by the end of this show. <laughs> guys, thank you so much for Thanks, starting guys. off this conversation. So now you know the future of music investing here, but how do you put it to work in your portfolio? Allie and Madison are sticking around to break down the details next on Yahoo Finance. Stay tuned. Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news. Three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with a ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. Right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Mester Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas, and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there is more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light in space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance. Continuing our discussion on music royalties, are they a way to recession-proof your portfolio, or is it just a flashy investment that could end up leaving you with taxes to pay off with those royalty yields? Joining us to discuss the pros and cons of music investing, we've got Michael McCune, the Chief Investment Officer at Markham Wealth, and we're also joined by Clayton Durant. He's the founder of CAD Management. That's a music management and entertainment consulting firm. Guys, great to have both of you on. Thanks for coming in. Michael, I want to start with you. What would you say is the single biggest factor that an investor should consider when sussing out whether or not this is a good investment? Yes, I think the number one thing to look at is cash flow, because these are contractual obligations for a catalog or a song. But investors need to think about how much are they getting paid relative to other options in the marketplace, whether other bonds, treasury bills at five and a half percent, and then also, what are the tax consequences? Because an 8% pot potential yield really may be 4 or 5% after taxes when you're in a higher tax bracket and state. And Michael, we've been talking a lot about the Shrek soundtrack, how you can invest in that. That's sort of what inspired this segment. If your client came to you with that, what do you think? Is that a good investment? Well, you know, I think it, com it comes down to is a client's financial plan include private credit as an asset class within a portfolio, right? Private credit is probably about 1% of the tr hundreds of trillions of dollars that you could invest in. Inside of private credit is royalties, and that's probably 1% of that. So I think it comes down to sizing and really what the client's risk tolerance and overall objectives are. And private credit, alternative assets, such a mega trend right now. But Clay, I want to bring you into the conversation. You know the music space so well here. What would you say is the biggest misconception about music royalties? Well, I think the first thing investors need to understand is what side of the royalties are they actually investing in? So for every song that you stream on Spotify, there's two underlying copyrights versus the performing arts copyright, which is essentially the composition, right? Your lyrics, the melody, and all of that. That has its own ecosystem of royalties. Royalties. The second copyright that exists is the sound recording. So that's your master that you actually listen to. So depending on what you're actually investing in, you have to consider those different types of royalties. Now, some of the uh, big catalog sales that you've probably covered, the hypnosis songs funds of the world, the round hill capitals, and all of them, they're actually investing mostly in the publishing. So that's the composition side. And there's a reason for that, uh, because most of the time, most of the value is actually concentrated within the publishing area, uh, particularly around the mechanical license and the fact that for every composition, there can be multiple masters around that. So there is a lot of expansion opportunity to own the actual publishing rather than owning the master. And most of the uh, investment that you're seeing for your average retail investor is actually on the master side. So the yield is going to be a little bit different depending on what area uh, you're actually getting to invest in. And Clay, the good thing for investors is there's a lot of public data out there when it comes to music. Is there a single data point that investors should be really focused on, like, TikTok plays, Spotify streams, when trying to determine the ROI of a song? So again, like it depends what area you're actually getting to invest in, but I think a common synergy between both copyrights is the syncability of a song. It's a little bit of a qualitative insight, but you really need to understand where can this song go and get licensed? It, can it be in an advertisement? Can it be in a theme park? Can it be in all these other spaces? And I think that once you've been able to wrap your head around, okay, where can this song actually go and get placed? The ability to actually go and get new fans to stream and consume that song will actually lift both areas of the copyright, no matter what area you depended, uh, that you actually own. So. I think that's a really big consideration that you have to think about not only is what's the syncability, but what's the overall marketability of that catalog that you own. And that's a really big question that these really big investors who are buying these rights for multi-millions of dollars are asking themselves. They have to say, hey, how much can I actually increase this catalog and how can I get new fans who may have never heard of a Bruce Springsteen before to get involved and actually listen to his back catalog? And the same question needs to be asked from a retailer investor side. Can they actually go and get people to actually stream a new song? And I think for the Shrek catalog in particular, that's going to be tough unless you actually get the original IP for the movie in different areas and different places because realistically they're very correlated together. And there's, to me, I'm not sure how much syncability and how much marketability there is outside of that movie IP that surrounds it. 
So given that background, Michael, what would you say the percentage allocation should look like for an investor, specifically not just to all assets, but to music royalties in particular? Yeah, I mean, I think it really comes down to, like I said, the larger picture. How does private credit fit in somebody's portfolio? And thinking about the overall risks that Clayton talked about. For example, you know, an artist could have the rights well within you know, their recording uh, ability to re-record the, their album, like Taylor Swift mm -hmm. we saw, correct? That has a risk on your cash flows that you may not have thought about before. By the way, Taylor's version for me, of course. <laughs> yeah, of course. But, um, but I, I would say most likely a modest percentage is is really what uh, is is what we're thinking about. I think if any, uh, if it's appropriate. And if I can add on to that point, right? Her re-recorded version of that actual song. The, if you own the publishing of that, you would still get paid on the actual re-recording, right? Oh, Which yeah. goes back to the point of no matter what you're investing in, really understand what area of the copyright you actually own. And I think if you're very clear on that, you can get a much better uh, understanding of whether the investment's gonna be really strong long-term or not. And there are a few uh, publicly traded music royalty funds out there that are open to investors like Hypnosis, Songs Fund, Mills Music Trust. Can you explain the difference there? And is that a better play than perhaps investing in a particular song or catalog? Well, I think investing in a particular song or catalog, you have to do a ton of due diligence, which I'm sure is you know on your side of things. But um, I was recently at a uh, panel uh, at Luminate, and they spoke about the amount of money that it takes to do due diligence. And look, these reports that come around the world and all these different royalty streams take a lot of people to actually go and dig through the data. And it takes a lot of money to be able to go and do that. And I don't think that the average investor has the capability or maybe the knowledge set to accurately go and do that. Now, if you go and invest with, the, let's say, a hypnosis, I think that might be a better bet because they have a huge swath of actual catalogs right. that span different genres. I mean, for, for hypnosis in particular, right? They own Shakira, they own uh, a variety of different uh, catalogs in different genres, which means they're pretty uh, uh, wide in terms of um, you know, uh, the, the consumption trends that are happening. Um, so I think, uh, if I were on the uh, on the investing side, I would probably spend more of my money on a hypnosis and mm -hmm. investing there rather than trying to take the chance on one bespoke catalog. Unless, again, you have something incredible like a Michael Jackson catalog. But again, th there right now there isn't a sort of retail investor market to own a, even a fractional piece of something that valuable. Most of those catalogs are going to the companies that you just mentioned. Well, hypothetically then, Let's talk about your investment portfolios when it comes to the music side of things. Michael, who are you picking? What's your favorite track? Well, I mean, an all-time classic. It's got to be Journey, Don't Stop Believing. Mm. I mean, nostalgic, the longevity. <laughs> Always I at mean, a wedding. I mean, <laughs> if, if you're not playing that song at the end of a wedding or a party or a bar, I mean, right. you're doing it wrong, right? I, absolutely. Play. <laughs> I, I think for me, like, the Latin music boom has been absolutely incredible. Uh, the RIAA, uh, you know, showed that Latin music actually grew to a billion plus dollars this yeah. year in the U.S. And I think that really speaks the volumes in terms of the actual value that can be unlocked with Latin music. Music. So I'd bet pretty big on Latin, you know, both catalog Latin that, you know, from the Shakira uh, era all the way to, you know, possibilities of trying to get involved with artists like Bad Bunny. And I think there's a lot of value to be unlocked there. Um, and if you can take that uh, opportunity, that would be somewhere I would take a look at. All right. I'm waiting for Taylor Swift. I mean, she's no. the moment right now. So <laughs> I think I'd, I'd, I'd go for her, but we'll have to wait and see. Uh, Michael McEwen, thank you so much, along with Clay Durant. Appreciate you. all of your insight. We'll be right back on Yahoo! finance.
morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news, three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. All right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Investor Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas, and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there is more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light and space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance. We're live from the NASDAQ in New York City. Well, earnings season picking up steam this week with results from Goldman Sachs and Bank of America due Tuesday. The reports following solid results from their Wall Street peers last week. But despite upbeat results from J.P. Morgan, Citigroup and Wells Fargo on Friday, the bank's top executives are warning of potentially challenging times ahead. J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon said in the company's latest earnings call, quote, that this may be the most dangerous time the world has seen in decades as the bank continues to prepare for a broad range of outcomes. That was in the results. And also Citigroup CEO Jane Fraser saying that the recent macro headwinds have made a clear impact on investor sentiment. Let's talk about that. We want to bring in Ben Eisen. He's a reporter with The Wall Street Journal. Ben, it's good to see you. So the results here from many of the large banks that we've heard from so far are actually pretty solid. But comparing that to the tone and some of the messaging that we're hearing from Diamond and what we heard from Charlie Scharf and Jane Freezer, I guess, what was your, what's your assessment so far of earnings this season and how banks are positioned given some of that gloom and doom uh, outlook to some extent? Well, I think what you're seeing is that the a lot of the bank executives are sort of signaling that we're kind of at a crossroads at this point. Um, you have consumer spending, which has continued to hold up. Uh, consumers and businesses have been really healthier than than pretty much anyone had expected, given all the interest rate uh, increases that we've seen. But we're starting to see some of the kind of downside of higher rates pop up, which is that um, you have loan losses starting to rise. You have demand cooling for loans. You have just so, sort of some of the, um, the, the the friction that comes from higher interest rates are is kind of starting to hit us at this point. And, um, you know, to be fair, all these executives have been sort of calling for a slowdown for for some time now and we haven't really seen that yet but um you know as we get further and further along into this kind of era of higher interest rates that we've seen uh we are kind of seeing uh some of that slowdown come well and, yeah and one of the other factors as well here that we had started to see rear ted is is delinquencies even on those loan payments as well with all of that considered and what jp uh jamie diamond JP Morgan CEO and chairman had to say about consumers right now in tracking where they're spending down and some of the excess cash buffers they have starting to uh, dwindle or diminish here even more so. What do you extrapolate from how much longer consumers can face this type of pressure? You know, it, it really remains to be seen. Um, you know, when you think back to the pandemic and all of the the economic stimulus that the the government handed out to consumers, it really gave um, a lot of people a very hefty cash cushion, and it's taken a lot longer than most anybody has expected for that to um, get spent down. Now you are starting to see people spend down that money, um, and you have higher inflation, which is kind of causing everything to cost more. Um, so, so, so it, it really, you know, it, it, it kind of depends who you ask whether or not we are kind of getting to that point where those extra pandemic savings are getting depleted. But, um, you know, the further and further along we get, we get from that, uh, period of time, uh, the more those dwindle. Um, so, so, it, you know, it, it really only gets tougher from here. 
Ben, headcount is another thing that uh, many analysts are keeping a close eye on, not only when it comes to the big banks, but obviously uh, many industries at large, but more specifically what we're hearing from banks so far. And I bring that up because PNC talked about the 4% reduction in their workforce and the, co the cost of savings that they are potentially going to see as a result of that. Is this a trend that you expect to see this season or maybe in the coming quarters among some of those smaller, more regional plays? You know, I think we're already starting to see some of the cutbacks that are taking place. Um, you've got some of the big banks have been cutting their staff uh, uh, for a while now, um, for the last few quarters. And I think you probably will uh, see headcount reductions um, being announced at, at at a lot of the regional banks. PNC announced that they'd be cutting some staff on Friday. Um, and, you know, as these regional banks, which really are, are a lot more pressured than the big banks um, in this current period of time, uh, they are uh, uh, they're going to be the ones that are going to have to um, take more drastic cost cutting actions. And when you think about going forward from here for I mean, we've focused on a lot of the regional bank and the, the turmoil, the sentiment that that seems like it's in the rearview mirror to a certain extent, but maybe just because it's settled relative to the turmoil that we saw play out earlier this year. Do you expect any of these companies, especially in an era of perhaps cost discipline, as it's come up in one report, at least over the course of this earnings season, do you expect any of them to be thinking about further consolidation? You know, it's definitely something on people's minds. Um, we haven't seen that much of it yet. Um, but 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 yes, we've so we've 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 had this banking crisis that, that took place in the spring, and uh, maybe the acute phase of it is over. You don't necessarily have the kind of bank runs that we saw in March. Um, but then you have these these companies where their business model has really been very challenged by uh, uh, these higher interest rates, where they're paying more to hold on to deposits, and um, uh, that that really throws a wrench into their their business model. So, so definitely, banks that are, um, you know, too uh, maybe per perceived as too small to make it on their own are going to be looking around. Um, whether or not that picks up, or uh, when that picks up, we'll have to wait and see. I mean, you have a lot of kind of factors that uh, will play into that. Um, you know, we have new regulations, capital rules that have been proposed. Um, and, you know, there's sort of a, um, uh, regulators have a certain uh, amount of uh, uh, skepticism towards certain consolidations and in certain industries. So we'll have to wait and see how that all plays out. Um, but it's, it's definitely something that we would expect going forward. Ben Eisen, Wall Street Journal reporter, joining us here today to not just talk about the banks that have reported, but preview some that are set to come here. Ben, appreciate the time. Thank you. Thanks. All your markets action ahead, live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
JP Morgan has upped their estimates around how much the UAW strikes will cost big automakers. Already, the strike is estimated to have cost GM and Ford more than $500 million each since the effort began. And with no clear path ahead to a compromise, the damage could only continue. JP Morgan estimates that GM could continue to lose $21 million, and that's per day, <laughs> and $44 million a day for Ford here. However, the UAW expanded its strike to Ford's crucial Kentucky truck plant. Ford could now lose as much as $44 million per day there on the comparisons that you're seeing there on your screen. With more, let's bring in Greg Migliori, who is the Autoblog Editor-in-Chief. Greg, I mean, these are coming into massive sums at this point, and... Ford had already come out last week and said economically we've already kind of hit their threshold or hit this limit, at least that's what they said, but now this is continuing to have a day-by-day -day impact on just production, on even hits to being able to monetize what they've already sought to bring to market in the, in the future weeks and months here. So what type of broader impact, how much longer could we see this play out? Hey, good morning, everybody. So the UAW expanding the strike to the Kentucky truck factory, you nailed it. That's the single most, I think, significant development of the strike so far. That factory accounts for $25 billion in annual revenue for Ford. That's larger than a lot of major companies. What do you think about that? Now, there's other factories that do build the F-Series, uh, including the historic Rouge plant that's in Michigan. But this is a significant blow. Uh, this is the F series has been the best selling vehicle in the United States since the late 1970s. So by targeting this factory, it really sort of ups the ante. It uh, it really puts more pressure on Ford. Now, on the other hand, General Motors agreeing to bring in some battery factories, uh, allow them to be unionized as part of the master agreement uh, is perhaps the most significant milestone towards progress, I think. Uh, you know, they also made some progress over the weekend uh, with GM and Ford in the last couple of weeks agreeing to deals with the Canadian unions. So these things are possible as far as reaching an agreement. The last strike actually went about 40 days. That was a national strike against General Motors. And, uh, you know, it definitely, you know, hurt that automaker for, you know, several months, several quarters as far as profits. But uh, right now it's tough to tell when it's going to end. So, Greg, we still don't really know about the timeline of this. Obviously, millions at stake when we break it down by that per day impact. But when we talk about a new contract and what that could potentially mean here for these automakers, any sense just how big of a hit they could take if they do, in fact, go with what the unions want to say in terms of the inclusion of the upcoming battery plants and then also just the higher salaries and benefits? Right now, it's a little hard, I think, to kind of cut through sort of the rhetoric uh, on both sides as far as just how much of a financial impact this might have long term. Uh, we do know General Motors has uh, signaled that they might take a $200 million hit just in third quarter earnings, which we're going to hear about later this month. So obviously, they're going to start to feel that impact immediately. Uh, you know, bigger picture. Labor has always been a part of costs for any automaker. So whether they end up with like a 23% raise, which is what Ford most recently offered, or something closer to what the union has uh, asked for, which was closer to 40, uh, perhaps they meet in the middle and maybe they find a number that's tenable for both sides. All right, Greg, we're also watching Tesla. It's a big story this week. We're going to get earnings results from the company after the bell on Wednesday. When it comes to the EV maker, lots of talk about the pressure that the price cuts are going to put on margins. And, of course, this comes after their third quarter delivery numbers fell short of what the street was looking for. Give us the sense of what you're expecting to hear from Tesla and how that's going to shape maybe the price action that we see in the stock over the coming months. It's really interesting. Tesla has cut prices multiple times this year, and several of their models are actually really good deals. It's actually a pretty good time to buy a Tesla if you can get your hands on one. Uh, they're below the average price of a new vehicle, which was $48,000 in October. Now, the other side of this for Tesla is lower prices cut into margins, which means third quarter earnings are probably going to be a little bit uh, lighter, more pedestrian than we've seen in some recent years. Uh, the other hand, they've succeeded in propping up sales. Sales were up about 27% in the third quarter. So it's going to be a bit of a mixed bag, I think, here for Tesla. Uh, the competition has gotten tougher. That's a big takeaway I see. Uh, you guys ran a study that said 57% of uh, U.S. car buyers 
are not interested in EVs. And that tells me you have that on one side, and then you have all these new EVs from Hyundai, Ford, Volkswagen, General Motors. The list goes on. There's, you know, right now the pie has gotten bigger. So I think that's put more pressure on Tesla, uh, and it's a much more competitive landscape. You know, as you take a, like a longer look, though, Tesla stock is still up about $50 from last year, and it's more than double right. from that low point it kind of hit in January. So I think they're going to have an okay, I think, performance here with the third quarter earnings. The big thing is, is what are they going to say about the Cybertruck? That's what I'm really okay. uh, looking most forward to. So that's that's exactly where I wanted to go, Greg. What what could they say about the Cybertruck that would perhaps put investors' attention and even analysts' attention on on that you know traveling shape uh, is what is it essentially? I mean, my goodness, we haven't actually seen it come to market. We don't have a time frame. We don't know pricing strategy really on that. And so, what could they possibly indicate? So they did kind of like dole out a little bit of soup, if you will, in the last week. News has come out that they're going to, that they have a, an agreement with a Finnish manufacturer uh, for the metal panels that will go on the truck, which is a very unusual uh, approach to manufacturing. You don't see uh, this type of material used very much. Uh, so they sort of kind of, you know, dribbled it out a little bit. I think anything else they can say about that will be, uh, you know, eagerly awaited by uh, investors. And, you know, again, we don't know a ton about pricing, uh, more details about the truck itself, where they're going to sell it, the sort of rollout. All of that stuff, I think, will be crucial for Tesla. Certainly will. We'll get those results after the bell on Wednesday. Greg Migliori, always great to have you. Thanks so much, Autoblog Editor-in-Chief. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. Well, we've got all your market action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Keep it right here. You're watching Yahoo Finance. There's no bad blood for Taylor Swift this weekend after her Eras Tour film became the highest opening of all time for a concert film, bringing in between 95 to $97 million in its debut. This is according to the latest numbers out from AMC. And Swifties showed out for the opening with roughly 4.8 million people attending the release. For more on this, we want to bring in Sean Robbins, box office pro chief analyst. Sean, it's good to see you. So just shy of those 100 million projections that we were talking about leading into the weekend, 
but certainly a massive success. What do you think this tells us just about maybe what's necessary and what's needed in order to regain some of that momentum at the box office? Yeah, it's a great question, and thank you for having me back. I, I think this is a weekend theater owners have been very thankful for in the wake of a few delays caused by the writers and actors strikes over recent months. Of course, the writers strike is resolved, but the actors continues to go on. So that's that's movies like Dune, Craven the Hunter, Ghostbusters all left the end of this year. And then all of a sudden, Taylor announces this movie a couple of months ago. And here we are talking about almost a one hundred million dollar opening weekend basically created out of thin air. This is not something something that was on the industry's radar just as recently as the end of summer. Wow, okay. And yeah, I, I remember many of these other films, especially This Is It, not so much the Justin Bieber one that we were showing on screen. All this considered though, I mean, there's been so much fanfare going into this Taylor Swift concert movie here. How much of a long tail do you think this could have? Number of repeat viewers, people were going back to see uh, a few films, but not like, not like this is projected. We heard accounts even within our own team of people who went back three times over the weekend. Wow. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the crazy thing. This, <laughs> and that's what made this movie challenging to predict is because it, it's not your typical Hollywood movie. Taylor has a very loyal, dedicated fan base that, that turns out and really drove those pre-sales and ended up making it very front loaded in that aspect. And I think that's what caused a lot of volatility and projections. But now it's going to rely on those fans to keep going back to see multiple repeat viewings. And it's a weekend only engagement, which also makes it outside the outside the norm because it won't have those weekday shows to to catch any of the demand spill over from the weekend. So it's really tough to look at it that way. But I think it's baked into how she planned this out with her team, having four weekends in movie theaters and essentially giving fans an option who maybe didn't get a chance to see the concert in person, this is the next best way to do it. And that's, I think, what theaters and concerts share in common. It's a communal experience. And we heard a lot of stories about that over this weekend with a lot of interactive uh, audiences singing along and dancing at, at all of these screenings. So it's it's really kind of an outside the box approach to to movie going right now and something that I, I think we could see more of going going forward. Sean, any, I guess, how would you compare the domestic opening and excitement here to some of those international numbers and how much this strategy maybe just works with that core audience? You talk about the fact that people going back two or three times versus people who like Taylor Swift but maybe aren't as excited to run out there and buy those tickets right away. Yeah, I think that was also part of the challenge in, in really trying to assess how much hype was being generated around the movie. And how many of her, you know, maybe more casual fans would, would show up to see this? And I think her appearance in, in the media over the last few weeks with Travis Kelsey and, and that entire narrative has been an interesting angle to all of this. Uh, it, it's hard to, to really say, did that help the movie? Did it maybe create a little fatigue for people who weren't already, who weren't going to go see it? It's, we'll never know. I, I think that's just speculation. But I, I think in the end, this is this is something that is really just a huge positive result for for her and for theaters. And, you know, we kind of look now back at what happened when Hannah Montana slash Miley Cyrus movie came out about 13, 15, 15 years ago. Justin Bieber, there was kind of a wave of these concert films that did really well. And, and then they kind of stopped for about a decade or so. Maybe this kick starts another trend like that. We already know that Beyonce has a film coming out uh, in December. So, you know, Taylor has set a high bar. I don't think we can expect to see this kind of a result every time, but I think every little bit is, is going to help theaters and, and obviously artists want to connect with their fans as, as much as they can. Okay, you teased it there. Renaissance, a film by Beyonce. We, what do you believe that we could, we could extrapolate or take away from Taylor Swift's success at the box office and, and perhaps apply to the Queen Bee? It's, you know, it's still tough to say. I, I would probably look to maybe some kind of opening similar to those Justin Bieber, uh, Miley Cyrus, Michael Jackson numbers back in the late aughts, early tens. Somewhere in that, you know, 30 to $40 million kind of opening is, is the initial expectation, I think, right now. It, you know, but it's hard to say. Maybe maybe something really catches on in the next few weeks. She started pre-sales for her film way further in advance than Taylor. So it's really hard to kind of compare where they're at in their, in their life cycles. But it, it's, you know, never never doubt Beyonce, just like we never doubt Taylor. I think they're they're kind of both making very smart moves here. And we'll see what happens. That's, that's, that's an interesting weekend to release a film. And she's already kind of guaranteed to have a, a very strong result, historically speaking, for what's a very slow period on the calendar after Thanksgiving. All right.
All right. Maybe I'll buy my tickets. Uh, maybe, you know what? I'll just see them both in the same weekend. Why not? Just one big concert not? weekend. <laughs> Sean, you down? You down to roll? I'm doing it. Yeah, I'm with I'll you. Take that as a yes. All right. Done deal. <laughs> Sean Robbins, Box Office Pro, Chief Analyst. Sean, great to speak with you here this morning. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. All your markets action ahead live from the NASDAQ market site. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. Elon Musk makes electric vehicles, rocket ships, and beer? Yes, that's right, Tesla beer, aptly named Cyber Beer. Could be yours for a mere $150 for two bottles. Much like his rockets, the beer bottles are reusable and they were designed to be reminiscent of the Cyber Truck. The beer is brewed by Buzz Rock Brewing, a California brewery not far away from Tesla's showroom in Southern California. But good luck buying it. As of this morning, it's sold out <laughs> on Tesla's website. This isn't the first time Musk has branched out into the beverage space. In 2020, they sold Tesla to for $250 a bottle. Now they resell upwards of $900. I didn't know there was a resale market for some of these. Me neither. But apparently so, especially for the tequila. I imagine that that holds a lot better for longer. But anyway, this is this is the look at it. And you've got what, the Stein, uh, the Cyber Stein in there as well. So, I mean, it looks. It, it looks very Cybertruck-esque. It does look Cybertruck-esque. I guess it's a smart idea, right? They have us talking about it, drumming up some some press, even more press, right? We've been waiting forever, it seems like, for this Cybertruck. Still has not come, so they're trying to do everything they can to so continue the, the conversation. <laughs> you have a beer while you wait for the Cybertruck to actually start rolling off the production line and mass. But we talk about the fact that Elon Musk is so smart, right, when it comes to marketing, when it comes to getting his name out there. Yeah. Smart, maybe I think he is smart in how he does it. Some people, I think, obviously take issue with a lot of ways he goes about things. But I do think it has us talking about it. It's another... They're not going to generate a heck of a lot of revenue, right, for this. Yeah. And like you just said, it's not the first time they did They did it with tequila. They also did it with a much cheaper beer when they were opening one of their uh, gigafactories in Berlin a few years ago. So we talk about the fact that, hey, it's just another thing that Tesla's doing. They want you to be talking about it. They want you to be hyped for the Cybertruck. Why not start selling beer for 150 And it's already sold out. Is the, I Who mean, knows how many they sold is that, is that the thing? Are people, and this is the tequila. Yeah. Okay, so is, are we buying novelties and things from car companies of vehicles that we don't own or perhaps just no. not I think if GM and Ford were to do this, no, I don't think the do same well. demand would be there. But it's Elon Musk. That's right. People yeah. love Elon Musk. They're believers in Elon Musk. Love. They're going to be buying anything, love. almost anything, that he sells. So it's no surprise to me that this already sold out. 150 bucks. That's it, it, a heck of a lot to pay. 
for two beers, and what do you get? Two mugs. Yeah, exactly. I mean, look, he sold belt buckles. He sold, um, oh my gosh, I mean, flamethrowers with the Boring Company. Oh, yes, I forgot about that. How could we forget about the flamethrowers? <laughs> uh, he sold those. He sold the short shorts for all the short sellers right. back in the day mm -hmm. of Tesla. So, gotta give it to him. Capitalizes on any trend available. He does. He does. Well, time for a quick check of the markets here, <laughs> taking a look at the major averages here in the U.S. We're up across the board right now for the Dow, the S&P 500, and the Nasdaq, seeing gains of about 1.1% for the Dow and the S&P 500, and the Nasdaq, all of them, seeing some solid gains to start off the week. I pull up the Wi-Fi Interactive, but I got to save something for you for tomorrow, folks. That's all from us today. You can tune in to the next hour. Rochelle Cupo's got you covered during the 11 a.m. Welcome to Yahoo Finance. It's 11 a.m. on the East Coast, 8 a.m. on the West. I'm Rochelle Akufo. Here's a look at what I'm watching this morning. From Netflix to Tesla, investors are looking ahead to some heavy hitters on tap for earnings this week. Which sector could be poised to dominate in the third quarter? We'll discuss. And Rite Aid is officially filing for bankruptcy, but its financial fallout may look different than previous retailers. We'll break that down for you. Plus, no bad blood for the box office this weekend after Taylor Swift's Eras tour film drew millions of fans to the theater. So what does, this, what does this signal for future releases to come? But first, let's take a look at how the major indices are faring this morning. A lot of those jitters that uh, ended the week really cut, all disappeared. We're looking at the Dow rallying now up more than 400 points on the day, up about one and a quarter percent. The S&P 500, they're also up about one and a third of a percent or 55 points. Tech heavy Nasdaq there also seeing solid gains up 162 points so far this morning for this big tech earnings week. 
With that in mind, let's also check in on the Treasury market. We know that last week we saw something of a flight to safety, but as we're seeing here, the five year up about one and a third of a percent, the 10 year also up, as you can see, they're about almost 1.7% on the day. And the 30 year yield, that's up about 1.7% on the day as well. Well, Treasury yields are yet again on the rise today as investors weigh an uncertain economic outlook. The markets are looking for any diplomatic update amid rising tension in the Middle East. The fear of widespread conflict around the outbreak of the Israel-Hamas war has driven up oil in recent days. Prices are currently ticking down this morning, though. But as we head into a busy week of earnings, is there an upside for the markets? Well, joining me now is John Lynch, Comerica Wealth Management CIO. Thank you so much for joining me this morning. So obviously investors ha had a lot to contemplate over this past weekend, especially with that backdrop of the conflict, plus this, this bumper week of earnings that we came off of for the banks and coming into this week. What are you watching in terms of market sentiment this week? Well, thank you, Rochelle, and good morning. Yeah, investors obviously woke up in a good mood. Uh, I'm not sure I figure out the morning trade thus far with 10 years yield up about 10 basis points and the equity market up about 1%. So this week, it's all going to be about earnings. I think it's going to be, uh, to a degree, clarity. If there's any diplomatic hope for a diplomatic resolution to the Israel-Hamas war, uh, I think that's unlikely. But any, any uh, positive signs, I think, would be uh, uh, refreshing. And to the degree that investors can just get that balance between market interest rates and earnings, this could conceivably be the fourth consecutive quarter of the earnings recession, yet projections are for maybe three-tenths of 1% decline on a year-over-year -year basis. So to the degree companies typically beat by about 3%, uh, we could see you know, 2 or 3% year-over-year uh, -year earnings growth. So that, that'll be real important. And certainly with some of those big tech names that you mentioned, uh, we'll be focused on those. And John, what are some of the bellwether stocks that you'll be watching, especially when you try and figure out the state of the economy and the state of the consumer as well? Yeah, the bellwether is certainly within communication uh, services. We're looking for maybe 30 percent earnings uh, increase for the group and then followed by consumer discretionary, call it maybe 20 percent year over year earnings growth earnings growth. And, uh, you know, leaders on those would certainly be meta platforms in the uh, in the communication services, and then, of course, Amazon uh, on the uh, uh, consumer discretionary sector. And of course, we've been looking at the impact of, of rising tech stocks, sort of lifting all boats for the rally that we've had so far this year. But obviously, market yields having their time as well. But you're saying that it's entering a new era. How so? What does that look like? Yeah, I think, Rochelle, that investors need to really recognize, you know, the you know, to the degree we avoided recession thus far, you know, the, the soft landing hopes, you know, we're seeing uh, uh, several dynamics that have me concerned. Uh, energy is outperforming consumer discretionary. So if this was really a uh, soft landing, we, we would see more, you know, consumer performance, whether it be staples or discretionary. That's one. Secondly, I don't think 10-year yields are rising because of optimism that we avoided recession. And I don't think it's a glowing uh, endorsement of future growth. I think rather it's a function of uh, treasury issuance, which could be up another 20, 25 percent over the course of the next year. As you know, uh, fiscal fourth quarter ending in September, we saw a 30 percent increase in treasury issuance. And consequently, I just think without the banks being buyers that they had been conceived previously, without the Federal Reserve having been a buyer, without uh, China and Japan uh, buying to the extent they have previously during QE, I do think that you're going to see upward pressure on yields. Technically, the 10-year uh, could go to 5 or 520. Um, and you also have to factor in that in periods where more uh, interest rates are at a more normalized level, if you will, the 10-year typically trades about a 200 basis point premium to the consumer price index. So for all those reasons, I think investors just need to recognize that it is a new era with interest rates, uh, even though uh, we may have avoided recession thus far. Um, and any, you know, you may have a defensive safe haven uh, bid on the 10 year. In the meanwhile, given, given Ukraine, given Israel, nonetheless, I do think there will be upward pressure going forward. 
And I mean, a lot of people still looking at this inflation picture. We're still getting a lot of Fed speak coming out. Chicago Fed President Austin Goolsby telling the Financial Times that basically moderating inflation isn't a blip. This is something that, that's here to stay. This is a, a trend that he's expecting to continue. What does that mean for how you advise clients who are trying to stay defensive, but also trying to take advantage of the gains as, as the market's indicating that they think we've perhaps going to skip a recession? Let's work. Let me tell you, Rochelle, let's work because it's uh, many, many challenging things coming at us, right? And what we're trying to do as stewards of our clients' assets is to direct them properly. And you have Goolsby's statement. We had Harker last week. So, you know, I, I believe uh, given the work that the 10 year yield has done uh, over the past month, think about it. I mean, we inflation troughed in July, yet the 10 year Treasury yield is still up 75, 80 basis points since then. So, you know, there's another dynamic going on here. So when advising clients, still want to make sure, you know, the slight overweight uh, value relative to growth uh, within the uh, intermediate uh, fixed income space, still like investment grade. I think it's too early to go longer durations. Uh, I still want to be in the intermediate time frame. I do believe the Fed is, frankly, I believe they're done. Uh, but I also uh, disagree with Fed Funds Futures saying we're going to have two cuts in the first half of next year. I think, you know, ideally the Fed, the way to play this, particularly during election year, they don't want to make a, repeat the mistakes of the Arthur Burns Fed in the late 70s, early 80s. This way, there's a situation where by keeping rates steady in that, say, five and a half percent Fed funds rate, as you get a decline in uh, uh core inflation measures, that enhances the uh, uh, real interest rate, which is a you know subtle way of keeping credit conditions tight so we don't have inflation coming back in a series of waves. Because I agree to an extent with what Austin Goolsby has said, but I do believe that the underlying pressures of core inflation will persist longer than the market currently believes. Indeed, and we've certainly seen that story play out throughout the year. I appreciate you taking the time to join me this morning. John Lynch, Comerica Wealth Management CIO. Thanks so much. Thank you, Rochelle. Well, investors looking for a rush of good news this earnings season have a particular sector in focus, big tech. Now, the five biggest companies on the S&P 500, that's Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Amazon, and NVIDIA, are behind about a quarter of the benchmark's market cap. Now, they, the hope is that they'll pick up the slack from other sectors that may still be mired in an earnings slump. Joining me now with more on this is Inez Ferre. Inez, what are you watching? Yeah, Rochelle, so those five stocks that you just mentioned, they have been leaders this year and they continue to be leaders and they're expected to be leaders throughout this earnings season. We want to show you a chart right now where you can see their earnings, those five stocks are expected to, on average, show an, er, a jump of 34% year over year. Now, as a whole, the S&P 500 earnings expectations is expected to be flat, but without those five mega caps that you just mentioned, earnings on average for the s and 500 companies would be down about 5%. I want to show you on our interactive the outperformance that we have seen when it comes to technology, consumer discretionary, which, which by the way, houses stocks like Amazon and also Tesla communication services, up 41% year to date. Now, we did see the 10-year Treasury yield going higher, as you just mentioned with your previous guests, but we have seen a little bit of a slippage when it comes to some of these tech names. But nonetheless, I mean, a huge outperformance for the year. Also, Keep in mind that a lot of these companies, I'm going to pull up the NASDAQ 100 chart here so you can see a, a, a year-to-date chart here of the mega caps on the left-hand side of the screen. Keep in mind that a lot of these companies, these tech companies, last year were tightening their belt. They were uh, either slowing their hiring, some of them had layoffs. Uh, you, we did see that, that the expectation of a recession last year was making them tighten their belt. And a lot of these companies have a lot of cash on hand. And cash right now is earning interest. Now, uh, as far as what this week is expected, we are expected to get Netflix, Tesla this week, also next week. We have, we have a chart for you showing you some of the names that we're expecting, Google, Amazon, uh, and Microsoft, and also Meta. In November, beginning of November, we're going to get Apple, and then we will get NVIDIA. And look, the expectations are still high for these companies 
one of the challenges may be that most of the most of the good news is already baked, baked in to their performance year to date that you have seen. And perhaps investors may sell the news. We'll have to wait and see. But I mean, NVIDIA up 214% year to date, Amazon up more than 57% year to date, Alphabet 57%. When we started this year, we really didn't expect this huge rally that we have seen in, these le in this leadership and this leadership, which is expected to continue on for the S&P 500. Rochelle? It's true. I mean, we know that NVIDIA has pretty much been the, the hero this year in, in that surprise. But even Meta, this time last year, no one was thinking that they'd see the kind of gains that they would see year to date as well. You know, it started off with that announcement of the year of efficiency. Investors bought into it and they, they just seem to be thriving here. Do you think Meta has perhaps a, a bigger hurdle to overcome than NVIDIA, which has a sort of clear market when it comes to generative AI? Yeah, and certainly Meta, which had its strategy last year, you'll remember at the beginning of last year, or part of last year, which was the metaverse and, and all, all of that uh, investment that was going to go into that. And then they really pivoted and they have and they also cut staff as well. I mean, so they really tightened their belt last year and really came into this year uh, with a different perspective. But it has been quite a surprise uh, for Meta as far as the performance that you that we've seen with the stock and meta has in the past done this before where you've seen the stock go down sharply and then it has risen up again indeed we'll always keep an eye on that one thank you for getting us up to speed our very own ns foray thanks so much thanks all right now taking a look at today's trending ticker let's actually take a closer look at chip maker nvidia now shares are on the rise this morning shaking off concerns around reports that the u.s will tighten its existing curbs on china's access to advanced chip making tech now after last year's limitations blocked nvidia's two most advanced chips from the china market the company released less complex versions that bypass u.s restrictions now the latest rules will seek to close those loopholes for now at least nvidia is still riding high up over one percent on the day. All right, well, all your markets action still ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Investors remain focused on the Middle East crisis and whether the U.S. and its allies can stop the clash from drawing in other countries, especially Iran. Now, Iran's involvement in the Hamas attacks are still unknown, but the country's commentary suggests they might eventually join the conflict, which could create serious oil supply issues. A full-blown conflict could push prices well above $100 a barrel and increase the likelihood of a global recession. Well, joining me now is Rebecca Babin, CIBC Private Wealth and U.S. Senior Energy Trader. Thank you so much for joining me this morning. Um, so set the scene for us here. In terms of how much of a game changer Iran's involvement um, would change things versus some of the, the other elements, as we've seen with, with commentary from Hezbollah as well. So that's a great question. I think Iran's involvement is the key focus for the crude market. And this is essentially because they are a huge oil producer. They are producing over 3 million barrels of crude a day and exporting close to a million barrels a day. Um, this is a huge factor as we look at how supply could be impacted, right? Right now, this conflict does not impact any crude supply. We're seeing a risk premium be built into crude prices on the fears that a country like Iran gets involved and potentially their production is impaired through a direct military strike, or we have enforced higher degree of sanctions on their exports. Um, so that's really the key. If Hezbollah, which is Iran's proxy, starts to engage Israel from the north, that will be a sign to crude traders that this is escalating. So those two things are really kind of the key focus for the crude market as we look at this, this terrible conflict um, as it unfolds. And obviously, with a lot of these still things up in the air, no, no one has, you know, obviously committed to more countries joining the military action here. But what is this doing in terms of the outlook for oil? And what are the signals that you're paying the closest attention to in what's going to de determine where oil prices go from here? So this is an excellent, excellent point, because if you look at the outlook, where we're trading right now is still about 7% below where we were on September 28th when we made the highs of the year and crude was well in the 90s, right? So the commodity experienced a 13% sell-off in the week prior to this um, horrible situation in Israel. And this was driven by the fact that macroeconomic fears, interest rate concerns, recession concerns, demand destruction concerns started to filter back into crude markets. Fundamentally, though, the crude market remains very healthy. We are in a place where supply and demand are very closely balanced, if not in a slight um, supply deficit heading into the end of the year. The macro factors of what the US dollar does to crude um, demand from EN countries remains a huge focus. Is there a recession looming in the US is a huge focus. When I look at the physical market though and the fundamentals, crude actually remains very well supported anywhere near the 80s in WTI. Um, now that is also really hinges on what Saudi Arabia does. They have been the key factor holding crude kind of in this stabilized range, let's call it 80 to 95 over the course of the last six months. They have um, said that they are going to roll their voluntary cuts until the end of the year, but reevaluate every month. A lot of the, the fundamental view hinges on what they do next. I think they stand pat and we continue to see crude trade really well supported in that low 80s range. Now, if we get into the 90s, we do start to worry about demand destruction, which I think is a very real thing. Um, and we will start to see those macroeconomic headwinds come in play and kind of keep crude contained. So outside of this geopolitical event, I think crude actually feels like it, it is grinding kind of on its base here in the 80s and has a potential to move higher should we ease some of the macroeconomic risks. The big question mark obviously is what happens with Israel in this conflict and how much geopolitical risk premium you wanted to apply to potential supply disruptions. And you raise a good point, because obviously this is happening alongside the Russia-Ukraine crisis, which then was more so affecting European markets, but we did see the price of oil tick up there. So when you look at the role that Russia has to play on this, especially with uh, sanctions coming in and price caps as well, how much um, potential does that have to disrupt the, mar the oil markets? 
Yeah. So right now, um, Russian flows are generally speaking, reaching the market. We don't have a lot of Russian supply being withheld from the market. The price caps, which have, we've blown through the prices on the price caps, um, haven't been strictly enforced. We did see a headline on Friday that the U.S. was going to sanction two vessels um, for infringing against the price cap. Um, however, I don't see Russia um, flows being disrupted into next year. I think that we will talk about enforcing some of those sanctions on a very um, kind of light level, and the Russian flows will continue to make their way to China and to India, because basically we need those flows on the market to keep um, gasoline prices at home domestically as low as they are, and we don't want to force a global recession through too strict of enforcement there. But what we're talking about is how the world is trying to redirect all the crude flows, keep the market well supplied in the midst of all of these conflicts, which is becoming more and more difficult as more conflict arises. So I don't think Russia is going to be in play next year, but obviously, you know, things can change very quickly on a geopolitical level. Um, so it's something you have to watch. And that's why the market is so sensitive right now. Every headline has an implication. And we're in a place where inventories are very low globally. So all of these factors could make the moves in crude larger than they might otherwise be if we had higher inventory levels. So just quickly then, if you're an investor trying to play the oil market right now, what should you focus on and where are the gains to be had here? That's a good question. I think the focus is going to come back to physical market fundamentals, supply and demand. Um, and I think when we look at how we head into 24, it's all going to be about how is demand holding up? Is China demand really starting to re to hold up or is it falling off because we saw all this pent up demand in 2023 and that fizzles? Is the U.S. hitting the recession? So I think that people are going to come back to those fundamental factors. In my view, we continue to see OPEC be very disciplined. And I think the play is to buy deep um, macroeconomic pullbacks that are overdone based on the dollar or rates um, anywhere below 80s, mid 70s and play for the upside trade there. And as you mentioned, it's tough with every headline sort of moving markets um, coming out of the Middle East. Appreciate you taking the time to join us this morning. Rebecca Babin, CIBC Private Wealth, U.S. Senior Energy Trader. Thank you so much. All right, we have all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Chaos continues in the House Speaker race. House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries saying informal talks are underway for a potential bipartisan solution. In an NBC interview, Jeffries saying Democrats are ready, willing and able to find a solution and that they will formalize conversations today when they get back to the Capitol. Now, this comes as Representative Jim Jordan is nominated for the position, but he's still scrape, scraping for a majority of the House votes. Now, many in the GOP remain skeptical of the far-right law maker, but Jordan can only afford to have a couple of no votes if he wants to win. For more on this, Yahoo Finance reporter Rick Newman. Rick, I know you've been following all of this. It, it, it really begs the question, who, who wants this job? Why would someone want this position? Uh, well, we know there are at least three people who want the job. None of them have been able to get it so far. I guess I shouldn't count Jim Jordan out just yet. Uh, but, um, you know, right now they're going through all the counting on Capitol Hill. Jordan is trying to lobby people into his camp. And the problem for Jim Jordan is there are uh, 15 to 20 so-called never Jordans who uh, just will probably not vote for him no matter what. So he seems to be getting his tally up. But as you pointed out, he can only lose four Republican votes, assuming that he gets no Democratic votes and he will he will not get any Democratic votes, assuming there is not some kind of deal with Democrats, which I don't think there ever could be, given that Jim Jordan is one of the more extreme conservatives in the House. So the uh, best outcome here, I mean, for people who are really interested in all the behind the scenes geeky stuff, you can go on Twitter and um, and look at um, all the excitement about how Jim Jordan, he got another vote here, he got another vote there. But it seems like the real outcome here is that Jim Jordan is not going to become speaker either. Uh, and then we have to figure out what comes next. If he doesn't get it, it's not that there, there's nobody else. There's no understudy, you know, number four, number five, number six, that seems ready to jump in, which means either the, the uh, speaker pro tem, which is uh, McHenry, he could they could try to find a way that he just sort of becomes the de facto speaker. Um, who knows if the parliamentary rules would allow that. Or you get to this other scenario you mentioned where there's some kind of compromise between moderate Republicans and Democrats. I don't think we're close to that either, though. And I know there've been, there's been some talk about perhaps changing the rules on the number of votes, but if you have a very small faction that's ultra-conservative that was able to throttle um, Kevin McCarthy's leadership here, and then moderate candidates don't seem to be doing well either, as, as well as um, your Jim Jordans, who, who would the ideal candidate be? I mean, you have Liz Cheney's name being thrown about. I, I, that's course. what everybody for, wants for to know, Rochelle. I mean, there is no there, nobody. The ideal Republican is nobody. Um, the Republicans really are functioning as two different parties. I mean, they are this rabble-rousing group inside the Republican Party that will not go along with the rest of the party uh, for the sake of the party. This is the this is the Tea Party wing, if you will. Uh, that's where kind of where it got started. And, you know, Democrats have a they have a radical left wing, too, which is the uh, AOC, the squad, you know, the sort of Democratic socialist group. But worth pointing out that when it came down to it and Nancy Pelosi, when she was speaker, when she needed those people to vote as Democrats for the sake of the party, they did. And Republicans are just not doing that. So um, I, I, I wish I had some better answer that, oh, yeah, we can all see how this it gets resolved. We still cannot see how it gets resolved. It's 13 days without a speaker, the most, uh, the longest period of time since 1971. This could go on for another week. It could go on for another month. It could go on all the way until middle December when the funding bills expire and then we have a government shutdown. Goodness. It's like we, we get tired of saying, you know, it's, it's a first for this sort of thing, but this does seem to keep happening. Always appreciate your takes. Thanks you for joining us. Yahoo Finance reporter yeah. Rick Newman. Well, today, President Joe Biden is traveling to Colorado to sell Bidenomics. Now, he's set to tour a wind tower factory in Pueblo, right in the home district of controversial GOP lawmaker Lauren Boebert. Now, Biden is set to talk about the Inflation Reduction Act, companies investing in clean energy and creating well-paying jobs. For more on Bidenomics, former governor of Montana, Steve Bullock, is here joining me. Thank you so much for taking the time this morning. So talk about the environment that the president is now heading into, obviously still High inflation, although we are seeing it starting to temper, but what is he really going to need to sell the people of Colorado on when it comes to Bidenomics? Look, Rochelle, let's also first look at what's already happened with Colorado. 3,500 new jobs in that state 
because of the Inflation Reduction Act. You look at the fact that 12 million new jobs have been created since President Biden took office. Unemployment is, what, 3.8% compared to, where was it, 62 um, 336,000 new jobs created in this country last month alone. Um, and that was doubling what most folks would say was happening. So, so I think what he needs to continue to do is say what he's been saying is that we're going to grow this economy from the bottom up and the middle out. And that's what, at the end of the day, Americans will be seeing. And it's tough, though, because when you look at uh, President Biden's approval rating, it does seem like the economic gains are not trickling down, at least as equally, to, to, to everyone. Why do you think that's not being communicated? Or, or what do you think is missing in the, some of the economic gains that we've seen with Bidenomics versus how people are actually feeling when they're at the pump or at the grocery store? No, I think, Rochelle, first we have to put this in perspective, right? In uh, what's Biden's approval rating? 40, 41 percent. If you go back to October 11th, or October 2011, what was President Obama's approval rating? Well, 40, 41 percent. So on the one hand, this isn't that uncommon in sort of an electoral cycle. And we're even much more polarized today than we were then. Uh, but I think what he needs to do is continue to do what he's doing, showing, you know what, we're working on behalf of the American people and all American people. And as you know, look, inflation, heck of a lot lower than it was, um, it's still, it impacts folks. So recognizing that people feel that, but at the same time, when you're having you know historic job growth and you're making investments that are durable investments, like the kind of 3,500 jobs created um, through the Inflation Reduction Act in Colorado already so far, those are jobs that are going to be part of our economy for quite some time. And they're not just lower service level jobs. So it's it's definitely, I guess, a precarious or difficult time in the political environment. But I think as long as President Biden continues to stay laser focused in the you know, laser focused in the U.S. on helping actually grow this economy, being the partner, making those investments where they matter. Um, we'll be saying, you know, next year, oh, yeah, he was at 41 uh, percent. I'll be darned. It's not that uncommon for presidents during sort of a reelect of the, this point in the cycle. And um, Americans trust him. And there's been a lot of focus on, you know, asking the president when it came to funding for Ukraine and things like that, why not more focus on the U.S. economy? And we're now getting reports that President Biden is delaying his trip to Colorado as the uh, Israel-Hamas conflict um, continues to, to not reach a settling point at the moment. How difficult is it for President Biden to really be able to tout some of these economic priorities when you do have that backdrop of geopolitical conflict and competition with China as well to contend with? Well, I think... Look, he's, for the last 50 years, he's uh, been demonstrated as a guy who can, you know, walk and chew gum at the same time. Um, so he needs to, and one of the things I think that we're seeing, and, you know, my heart and everybody else's heart is absolutely shattered over what's happened in Israel. But that is another demonstration of a time where we really need a leader, someone that can actually work to bring the country together, and more than that, bring the world together. And that's what President Biden has been doing through this conflict, through this invasion. And he needs to continue to do that. And as we go forward, um, I have no doubt that both the president and the administration will continue to also demonstrate and tout to the American people, whose side are you on? Meaning that they're fighting to make the average American or the average Montanan's life better. And that's what we need right now. And what would you say to people who are, who are wondering about some of these investments in clean energy? Meanwhile, you have you know strikes at the UAW and some of these some of these industries that are more sort of fossil fuel focused. How does he balance that? Because that's what former President Trump that's what he's trying to push. He's saying, look, it's it's too much trying to push this clean energy agenda when we really should be also focusing on fossil fuels for people who are you know union workers or who are in some of those more traditional industries. How do you think President Biden can win them over? Yeah, and let's look in comparison, like when President Trump was 
uh, president, there was a 50,000 UAW members on strike. And you never heard a dang thing from the president. And I think what President Biden needs to do, and this administration has had sort of an all of the above strategy, but what they're doing and what the Bipartisan Inflation Reduction Act said is let's make this not just a climate crisis, but a climate opportunity, an opportunity to create good jobs, to not leave communities behind and invest in areas that matter. I mean, that trip out to, as you noted, Congressman Boebert's district, um, a wind generating facility that will make a difference, not just to the climate, but it'll also employ folks. And that's what we need to be doing. And hopefully that message keep, keeps getting out there and people do feel better about the economy. It is tough out there with that high inflation backdrop for everyone. I do appreciate you taking the time to join us this morning. Former Montana Governor Steve Bullock, thank you so much. Thanks, Rochelle. Well, shifting gears now, what's stopping consumers from buying electric vehicles? Last year, a survey found that 60% of consumers were deterred from buying EVs because of high prices and the weak charging infrastructure. Now, this year, automakers listen to concerns, slashing their prices or adding more affordable options. Car makers even planning to build more battery plants in the US for EVs, creating more jobs and cheaper batteries. And the government as well, adding more incentives for buyers, amounting to over $7,500 in money back for some EV purchases. But it seems like it still isn't enough to grow the EV appetite. Gas vehicles continue to overwhelmingly dominate the industry. But some car makers are winning in the EV space, like Tesla, followed by Chevy, while others vying for a small pool of consumers willing to make the switch. Now, consumers do seem to be more willing to buy hybrids that combine a gas-powered engine with a battery, and those sales are growing. But while automakers are betting big on the EV revolution, it seems like consumers are not ready to make that switch, at least not just yet. All right, all your markets action still ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Rite Aid has officially filed for bankruptcy protection as it grapples with escalating debt and lawsuits alleging its involvement in the opioid crisis. And while it's not the first retailer to go through financial troubles, this time may look a little different. Yahoo Finance's Josh Schaefer has those details for us. Hey, Josh. Yeah, Rochelle, so the Rite Aid bankruptcy filing that we got last night on Sunday night is an interesting Chapter 11 filing for several reasons. So first off, there is the traditional retail aspect of this. Rite Aid wants to close some stores. They'll be able to get out of some of those leases via Chapter 11 bankruptcy and write off some of the dead rent, rent that they had been paying on stores that weren't even open anymore throughout this process. But I did speak with some bankruptcy lawyers this morning to sort of better understand this story for us. And Eric Snyder, the chairman of the bankruptcy department at law firm Wilk Oslander, explained to me two key things to look for in this. One that would make this case different is who could really buy Rite Aid? When you think about the antitrust laws that have been so closely tracked recently, you would really only look at CVS and Walgreens. Would that become an antitrust concern if one of those companies wanted to acquire Rite Aid? That's an interesting spin on this. And then you mentioned off the top, Rochelle, that opioid crisis and the lawsuits coming from the opioid crisis. The reason that is so interesting here is because when we go to bankruptcy court, the claimants on then are now gonna have to claim separate claims in bankruptcy court. So everyone that was suing Rite Aid to have to do the opioid crisis now has to file their own claim. And what it does is it puts it under one court, which helps Rite Aid in the sense that instead of going to 50 different states to deal with 50 different cases at minimum, really a lot more, they'll now work through one court which helps Rite Aid sort of settle this. And one, one thing that Snyder told me, he's worked in these cases before he worked on the Purdue Pharma case. He said, these claimants are gonna be unsecured creditors. Very often in bankruptcy, unsecured creditors do not see the whole dollar come back to them. He said these unsecured creditors might end up getting a total of somewhere in the hundred million dollars. But when you break it down among all the claimants, the people in this opioid crisis are not gonna be making out whole most likely now that Rite Aid has filed bankruptcy. So Rite Aid using bankruptcy a little bit as a tool here to deal with those court cases. And obviously that's something that, that is quite specific to Rite Aid, but then what will this mean for pharmacies and the sector as a whole? Yeah, Rochelle, and then when you zoom out and just think about where Rite Aid is in the space, they're the smallest of the big three pharmacies. You see there Rite Aid really mostly in the Northeast and then on the West Coast, there's not a lot of Rite Aids in the middle of the country, really not any at all on that map that they used in their bankruptcy filing. And you take a look at how many other CVSs there are, how many more Walgreens there are. You've got Walgreens at over 12,000 stores, CVS at over 9,000 stores, and then Rite Aid with just over 2,000 stores. So we're talking about a smaller piece of the pharmacy business. That's something that Rite Aid has really struggled with as it's become smaller over the last couple of years. There are some reports out there saying they've struggled to keep customers because they don't have as many locations. So if you get a subscription at Rite Aid, and then you go to move or you go somewhere else around your area, it's harder to find a Rite Aid. So it'll be interesting to see what from their strategy people have liked and what they haven't liked. And then again, getting back to that antitrust discussion that Snyder brought up for us, would CVS or Walgreens even be able to buy the assets? When we talk about bankruptcy, you remember just a couple months ago, Bed Bath & Beyond was able to just be bought out by Overstock.com because retail is such a big space. With pharmacies being so tight and really only a few competitors, you wonder if the FTC would let that acquisition be passed through. It's true. And you have to wonder if potentially it could end up in meme stock territory. It's a well-known mm -hmm. brand. You have a lot of short interest and, of course, a triggering event in a bankruptcy. So we'll be keeping an eye on that. Thank you so much. Our very own Josh Schaefer. All right, taking a look at Bitcoin, it's hovering around that $28,000 mark as bulls bet that the SEC won't appeal Grayscale's legal win, possibly paving a path for the first spot Bitcoin exchange traded fund. Yahoo Finance's Jennifer Schomburger joins us with the latest. A busy day for Bitcoin prices today. Hey there, Michelle. Yeah, that's right. Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies gaining a bid on hopes the Securities and Exchange Commission could soon approve the first ever spot Bitcoin ETF. The SEC will not appeal a federal court ruling that found the agency overstepped its bounds by rejecting Grayscale Investments plans to launch a Bitcoin ETF. After the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals ruling, a 45-day review process ensued that offered the SEC the opportunity to appeal the ruling. That period ended Friday, and the SEC did not appeal. The court will now issue its final mandate within seven calendar days. It's now up to the SEC on what to do next. 
This doesn't mean the SEC must approve Grayscale Spot Bitcoin ETF application, though it would probably need to come up with a stronger reason for a denial since the appeals court concluded that the SEC's prior decision to reject that uh, conversion was, quote, arbitrary and capricious. Grayscale has not yet engaged in dialogue with the SEC on its Bitcoin application since this 45-day period has ended, but plans to engage with them and move expeditiously to try to greenlight its application. If approved, Grayscale's GBTC fund would be ready in days to begin trading as an ETF, a Grayscale spokeswoman telling me in a statement, quote, the Grayscale team remains operationally ready to convert GBTC to an ETF upon the SEC's approval, and we look forward to sharing more information as soon as practicable. Yahoo Finance has reached out for comment to the SEC, but has not yet heard back immediately. Rochelle? All right. Well, I know you'll be following all of that for us. Appreciate that update. Our very own Jennifer Schonberger. Thanks. All right. All your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance. There was no blank space in theatres this weekend after Taylor Swift's Eras Tour film hit the big screen, becoming the highest opening concert film of all time, bringing in between $95 and $97 million in its debut, according to AMC. Yahoo Finance's Alexandra Canal has those details for us. Hey, Ali. 
Hi, Rochelle. That's right. Nearly $100 million in domestic ticket sales, an additional 31 to 33 million overseas. That's a projection from AMC. And you're right, for a concert film, these results are truly incredible. If you think about the types of movies that have debuted so far this year, this is the third highest opening of the year, even beating a film like Oppenheimer in terms of that debut. So just truly phenomenal. This was a very difficult movie to forecast due to a variety of factors such as premium surcharges, uh, how much the pre-sale factor would uh, eat into overall ticket sales when you think about all of those fans wanting to rush in and get those tickets right away. But it's clear that those Swifties showed up for this event. It comes at a very important time at the box office where we've seen a lot of potential blockbusters be pushed into 2024 due to the double strike in Hollywood. The writer's strike officially reached its conclusion after nearly five months, but the actor strike is still ongoing and does provide that overarching threat when we think about the box office, but a film like the Eras Tour movie certainly adds to that goal of the industry reaching $9 billion in ticket sales by the end of this year. And it also helps, uh, you know, this notion that there are other alternate forms of revenue that theaters can rely on, like concert films, to really full out this theatrical es slate, especially during some of those months where things are a bit slow. We'll have Beyonce's renaissance tour in movie form coming out in december so really just a, a lot to look forward to here at a time when originally we didn't and all of a sudden now we have taylor swift we have beyonce i think it's going to be really hard to recreate uh, the same type of momentum and the same type of enthusiasm with other artists but we'll see if we can ride this wave especially since live events are such a big thing right now post pandemic people just want to get out there and now they're showing up at the theater as well. And it's true because we wondered how some of these theaters were going to bounce back. But when you have something as interactive as an experience like this, I mean, my daughter picked out her outfit, her, her little Taylor Swift bracelets. She's all the way ready. And then, of course, we saw Beyonce turn up at the Taylor Swift uh, premiere with Taylor side by side. So you have these, these two amazing queens with their two concerts coming out. What are the expectations, though, for how Beyonce's uh, concert film is going to do? Yeah, I think it's roughly around the same. And depending on how Taylor Swift, if those fans continue to show up, if they go to multiple showings, that is going to be a big factor as well in terms of how the Beyonce concert film will do. But you're right, we have two of the biggest stars right now sort of having this dueling moment. However, they're, they're a bit of time apart. And I think if people go to the Taylor Swift show and they love it, I think odds are they're going to show up to the Beyonce show as well. I know it's slightly different in terms of the actual content the Taylor Swift Eras Tour movie, it is just the concert. It's not documentary style. You are up on your feet. You're singing those songs. Beyonce, I think you're going to see a little bit more of the behind the scenes of filming and behind the scenes of the tour, which I think people are curious about as well. Beyonce is this, you know, mystical figure in a lot of our world. So I think to get a little peek behind the curtain is very intriguing as well. I probably will go and see both. I saw Beyonce in concert, didn't get to see uh, Taylor, but I was like, the, the, movie I, the movie I could do, that I think I will do. And it's, it's a team event. I think about 20 kids are going to the, the Taylor Swift event. So it's, it's a moment. I love I'm it. looking forward to, <laughs> you know, you, why not? We need, we need some things to get excited about. Appreciate you as always. Our very own Ali Canal. All right, well, let's get to a check of the markets as we head into the noon hour. As we can still hear, still looking at green across the board here. Although some of those gains pulling back slightly there, we see the Dow now up just over 1% or about 340 points. The S&P 500 also pairing back some of those gains up just over 1% or about 44 points. And taking a look at the tech heavy Nasdaq as well, just over a 1% gain there, up about 136 points. Seeing some of that, that excitement that kicked off uh, the morning session starting to ease just a little bit. Let's also take a look at what we're seeing with the Treasury market as well, because last year we did see that flight to safety against the backdrop of earnings season and, of course, the Israel-Hamas conflict as well. We're seeing the five-year up about one and a quarter percent on the day. The 10-year still up solidly at 4.7 percent there, up 1.62 percent on the day. The longest-term 30-year yields, that's up at the 4.86 percent territory. That's up about 1.7 percent on the day. 
So still seeing something of that flight to safety and a lot of breath holding for when we get those big tech heavy hitters with earnings that are coming up this week that everyone's bracing for. And of course, Tesla, we're curious to see how they've been faring a lot of this, this hurrah about the Cybertruck that we're still waiting to see, but maybe we'll get a little bit more insight into how Tesla and the other big tech earnings are doing so far as they've been lifting the markets overall so far this year. Well, that does it for now. I'm Rochelle Cooper, but I'm back with you at 11 a.m. Eastern tomorrow. I'll see you then.